It's a day game, and it's baseball from Gainesville, Florida, as the Gators, the second-ranked team in the country, look for a sweep against a top-10 opponent. Florida's been red hot both sides of the ball this weekend, and they try to continue it against this scuffling Vandy team. Here's how it's gone down. Fantastic starting pitching once again. Brady Singer struck out 11 on a soggy Friday night, and they got a key home run from the SEC's best hitter, Jonathan India. Gators have been great late so far in this series. A couple of big seventh innings. In game two, it was Jackson Kowar who got the start, and another victory for the best winning percentage in Florida school history. And this time it was Keenan Bell with the big blast. It was a seven-run seventh yesterday, and Florida dispatched Vandy by a 10-2 final. So here's what the standings look like. Georgia won its series against AM, but Florida just a half game back. And by the way, from a national perspective, the Gators soon to be the number one team in the country. And with that, we welcome you. Happy Easter Sunday, everybody, and welcome to the Sunshine State. Tom Hart alongside Ben McDonald. Florida will be number one when the new polls come out. They look like the best team in the country. So often we focus on their pitching. This weekend it's been their hitting. Yeah, this year it's really been their hitting. They're a much different ball club this year when it comes to offense. Offense last year towards the bottom of the SEC. Not the case this year. Gators are better pretty much in every category offensively this year. Home runs are up, batting averages up, and, boy, they've been good in this series against a solid Vanderbilt pitching staff, 18 runs on 20 hits in just two games. On the other side for Vandy, they're trying not to get swept in a series they haven't been swept since 2012 in six years. That's a picture of consistency. Yeah, 59 consecutive SEC series they've gone without getting swept. And look, the goal in the SEC is to win two of three every weekend. If you win two of three every weekend, that puts you right around first place at the end of this 30-game grind. Vanderbilt's 5-3 and three going to this game. They find a way to win game three of this series. Hey, 6-3, and three, they are on pace. Here's a look at the batting order for Vanderbilt. The door is scuffling as a team over this weekend. Just a 162 team average with 26 strikeouts in the first two games. Very young squad, and some of the youngsters have been shuffled around. And we've got a treat for a Sunday. These aren't your regular Sunday starters. Tyler Dyson on one side, Mason Hickman on the other. Dyson came into his own in the postseason last year, was magnificent. Ben, walk us through his scouting report. Yeah, it's plus stuff again. I mean, you're going to see a fastball 92 to 96. He'll work both sides of the plate with that fastball, a two-seamer and a four-seamer. And, boy, when his breaking ball is on, it's a swing and miss type breaking ball. He can really strike you out, and he'll throw the left hit. The left, he's a a lot of changeups as well. So he's a three pitch guy, three to one strikeout to walk ratio. It is plus stuff. Kevin O'Sullivan coming off of a national championship last year, the first ever for Florida. It's another national championship weekend in the SEC. Best of luck to the Mississippi State women's basketball team tonight, trying to win a national title on the hardwood. Here's Austin Martin, freshman from just down the road in Jacksonville on the first coast, and he will lead things off for Vandy. Like a lot of guys in this Vandy batting order, he's been scuffling this weekend. He's only one for eight with a walk. And that might be the worst part of it. Just a 222 on base percentage for Vanderbilt's leadoff man. Yeah, I mean, it always begins at the top for your offense, and you want to have that guy to get on. And certainly Austin Martin has done that for the most part this year. Two hundred eleventh meeting between these two schools. Florida leads the all-time series, having won almost twice as many games as Vanderbilt. Tim Corbin leading the resurgent for this uh, Vanderbilt program over the years, and Kevin O'Sullivan on the Florida side. Very good friends. They were both on the same staff with Jack Leggett at Clemson. They got to know each other very well. In fact, they're in each other's weddings. Two balls and two strikes to Austin Martin from Tyler Dyson. And he runs one in on Martin, and Vandy's got the leadoff man on. They have not done a good job of getting the leadoff man on over the course of this series. They only did it twice yesterday. Yeah, Florida pitchers have been really good at that because if you can get the first out of every inning, the chance of the team scoring, of course, goes way down from there. Florida's been outstanding doing that so far in this series. These first innings is when you really want to hop on a starting pitcher, especially one like Tyler Dyson. Right before he gets his feet wet, if you will, once he finds his rhythm, these type of guys can really shut you down. That first inning, always tough for a starting pitcher. 
Nice and coming off of a start against Arkansas. Here's a bunt to move a runner over. And Paul able to put Martin into scoring position. Vanderbilt, one of the most efficient and aggressive base running teams in college baseball. But instead of a straight steal for Martin, they go with a sacrifice. So one down in the three-hole hitter, Philip Clark, coming up. Vanderbilt this series is just three for 15 with runners in scoring position. That's a 200 team average. On the flip side, Florida's hitting 333 in the same scenario. Curveball in for a strike. Yeah, and the woes for Vanderbilt, of course, didn't just start this series. If you go back looking over their last eight games, they've hit only 175. That's less than three runs per game. Of course, when you're scuffling offensively and you've got to come in to face a starting rotation like Florida can throw at you, it makes it even worse. A one pitch is waved at. The strikeout rate for Vandy has been high all season long. But it is through the roof this series. You look at the numbers over the last eight games, only three runs per game. And Vanderbilt has a 35% strikeout rate in the first two games of this series. Yeah, just too high. I mean, you, that's over a third of your outs. Check swing for Clark. They say win. And so Philip Clark strikes out on a ball up in the zone. What do you think? <laughs> that's a tough call for the home plate umpire. You know, we'll get a better view of it right here. Boy, that's one of them ones. Either. I would rather see the home, home plate umpire, you know, check the guy down at third base. Because as a home plate umpire, it's tough for you to watch the ball, the location, and the swing mm -hmm. as well. Tony, Tony Wall certainly thought he got it right. Veteran SEC umpire. Here's Julian Infante. Nice blend of youth and experience in this Vanderbilt roster. Infante, a junior out of Miami. And the heart of the order has certainly struggled this weekend. Just two hits and one RBI. But Infante's doing pretty well for himself. Three for eight with a 375 average. He was down in the bottom third of the order over the last few weeks. And now up into the cleanup spot. That one's just foul. Tim Corbin is all over that right 10 feet from the bag. That is not reviewable. It's not even reviewable in the big leagues. And Tim Corbin wants to talk to Tony Walsh about it. Boy, that is so close. Infante thought it was fair. Getting the crew together. Experimental replay throughout the SEC this year. Each coach is allowed two challenges. And as far as I'm aware, that's it. It's not reviewable fair or foul before the bag, but it is reviewable fair or foul after the bag. And Tony Walsh, you can talk with Tim Corbin, and they're going to discuss it. Corbin looking at a Michael Banks who's behind the bag. That's the uh, home plate umpire's call before it gets to the bag, and it's the third base umpire's call once it gets past the bag. And all it has to do is cross over a corner to be a fair ball, and you can understand why Tim Corbin would ask them to discuss it. It's a Vanderbilt team that could use any break it could get. Permanent NCAA replay, meaning this is in play for the NCAA postseason as well as SEC games. Reviewable call number one, specified fair or foul. It must first touch the ground or a fielder beyond the initial position of the first or third baseman. That's a little convoluted way of. <laughs> I think say break that down, for yeah. me, please. In the big leagues, it's simple. You can't review it before the before it gets to the bag. And the difficulty there is because the the angles that we're going to show you with cameras, it's almost impossible unless you have a camera pointing right down the line, which correct. Hardly anybody has, even in the big leagues. So that, that would be the one too. Strike three called. 
So tough break for Bandy on a borderline call at third, which would have given him a lead. Instead, back-to-back -back strikeouts of Clark and Infante. And Vanderbilt strands the lead runner. Our home half of the first inning, and the second-ranked Florida Gators sending their slugging lineup to the plate here. We'll see Lippitt, Maldonado, and India. If anyone gets on, Will Dalton will have a chance. And J.J. Schwartz limited the D.H. duties today. Suffered a slight knee injury yesterday, so he won't be behind the plate. Instead, it's freshman Cal Greenfield who will be back there. They're having a remarkable series, a 3-0-3 team average in 18 runs over the first two games. They've got a challenge on their hands. 6-6 right-hander Mason Hickman, part of the number one recruiting class in the country for Tim Corbin's squad, and he has been magnificent. He is undefeated this year, 5-0 with a 208 ERA. Yeah, I love the frame, 6-6, 230-pound freshman. You see the numbers, 88-92 to 92 with the fastball, 2-4 and four seamer. He is a strike thrower, fills the zone up, going to show you a slider and a changeup as well, and, boy, his last time out against LSU, he was outstanding. Complete game, only two hits, not a run, two walks, and nine Strikeouts. That was in a seven inning contest due to weather last weekend in Nashville. But this is one of the best lineups in college baseball. One of the best in the SEC. Arkansas would be in that same conversation. Deacon Lippitt is in the leadoff spot. Only two hits this weekend, but he's drawn three walks. 43 home runs on the year for this Florida batting order. The clouds have cleared. It is a very warm 67 degrees, but the wind is not blowing. So the ballpark's played actually pretty small the last couple of days. Yeah. Breaking ball to the right side under Ethan Paul in a diving attempt. And the Gators put the leadoff man on. That's exactly what the Gators have been able to do to the doors this entire series. Leadoff guys on Gators have found a way to score first in both of the first two games, which they have won, and they continue to put pressure on Vanderbilt pitchers and defense. Here's Nelson Maldonado hitting 333 this weekend with a couple of doubles among his three hits. Florida's won eight of the last 11 series against Vanderbilt. Mentioned that sweep in 2012, the last time Bandy got swept in SEC play. And they also swept him in 2008. Think about that from a consistency standpoint for this Vanderbilt baseball program. This is the first time they have lost three straight games since 2012. Yeah. They lost their midweek game and then the first two of this one. That 2012 team went to the postseason, lost in a regional against North Carolina State. NC State ended up coming here and losing in a super to Florida. Yeah, because you know how stout the SEC's been the last six or seven years, and to not have been swept not one time in that time frame says something. No rest in this league. And to give you an idea of how long ago that was, Preston Tucker, who's now in the big leagues with the Braves was batting in the three hole for Florida. Mike Zanino was batting cleanup. Tony Kemp was a sophomore that year for Vandy. He was in the two hole for Tim Corbin's squad. Vince Condi was a third baseman on the team. Tyler Beatty started the game in which they lost that Sunday game. They got swept. Been a while. One ball and two strikes to Nelson Maldonado. Florida, by the way, stealing a page from Bandy's playbook. They are seven for seven on stolen bases this series. Well, it's been part of Florida's game the last couple of years. Even going back to last year, they led the SEC in stolen bases with 83. They don't bunt. As Maldonado goes down looking. 
three sacrifice bunts only on the season for Florida. There's a handful of teams that only have one, but otherwise, it's among the fewest. Love this pitch. See the catcher, Scott, with two strikes, rocks to the inside corner for the freshman. Mason Hickman just dots it up right on the inside part of the plate. I love pitchers that finish in in this league because if you'll watch them with two strikes, most hitters are taught, all right, let's, let's, let's let the ball get a little bit deep. We know we got all speed pitches we got to deal with, but if you can paint the inside part of the plate with two strikes, it's special. Here's Jonathan India, who's riding a 14-game hit streak. That's an amazing number to me. How do you go from 274 to 437 and leading the league in a very short time? No, I mean, Florida's not going to bunt a whole lot. As long as they keep banging the balls out of the ballpark, I mean, I just don't think O'Sullivan's going to take a chance and, you know, and give up some outs. They don't have to. They're approaching the home run total from last year, 53 homers last year for Florida. That's amazing. Yeah, 43 already this year. So why would you give yourself up? Hey, we were talking yesterday about Jonathan India. You just mentioned the numbers and the improvement. And what he said is he's doing a better job of covering the outer third of the plate. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we might see that in this at bat against the freshman Hickman. Looked like they wanted to go away there, and he missed up. Well, I mean, he's got a better understanding, does India, of the strike zone this year, too. If you go back and look at his first couple of years, strikeouts were, of course, a lot higher. The walks were down a little bit. Just the opposite this year. Strikeouts are way down compared to last year. Walks are up, which tells me he's got a better understanding. And, you know, sometimes it takes kids a couple years to start to get a feel for the conference pitching, a feel for the strike zone, and the ability to lay off tough pitches. Hickman leaves it up again. Well, India's got a great field going right now. This 14-game streak, he's hitting 565 with a half a dozen home runs, averaging an RBI per game over the stretch and more than a run scored per game. And don't be surprised if he gets the green light right here, 3-0, as hot as he's been. Hickman misses up again. It's a four-pitch walk to Jonathan India. And the Gators have two on with one out. So Will Dalton out of Spring Hill, Tennessee. Junior college transfer for the Gators, and he is plugged in in center field today with J.J. Schwartz's knee injury. They moved Dalton to center and put Maldonado in right. With Cal Greenfield getting a start behind the plate. A couple guys from the mid state. Mason Hickman is from Hendersonville, Tennessee, out of Pope John Paul II. Two starts ago for Hickman, he allowed three earned runs against Mississippi State. That was his season high. And from a durability standpoint, he hasn't thrown more than 89 pitches yet this season. In for a strike, nothing in two. That's the separator right there. That's the pitch I think Hickman's really going to have to get going, that breaking ball, if he's going to be effective against Florida. They're a very good fastball team. They've shown it. All year long when it comes to hitting the fastballs, not many teams better. But you just got to stay out of the predictable counts. Well hit to the gap in left center field. This one on a line will roll to the track and off the base of the wall. Two are in, and Dalton gives the Gators an early lead. Take a look at that pitch. I mean, that's a ball that certainly it's going to be a strike, but it's off the outside corner for sure. And you see Will Dalton go out. Watch him go out and hook this ball. Gets around it, hooks it to the gap. And Florida does what it's done the first two games of this series, and that's score first. And when they score first, as good as the pitching is, as good as the defense is, makes it awfully tough to come back. But looking at the location of that pitch, that ball's on the outside black. That tells me as a pitcher, if a hitter can go out there and he can take that pitch, it's a really good pitch on the outside part of the plate, they're not respecting the fastball on the inside part of the plate. Florida is 17-1 this season when scoring first. 
That's the pitch, right? You see that fastball on the inside part? That's, I think, what Hickman's going to have to do. Pitch inside a little bit more, speed the bats up, and then use the breaking ball to change up his out pitches. But boy, if you stay one way away, 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 just like he did with Will Dalton in that situation, they're going to hurt you on a pretty good pitch. Down the line, foul ball. Must hit the ground behind the initial position of the first or third baseman if you want to review it. Yeah, so I like this sequence a lot right here. So it's been fastball in for strike one. J.J. Schwartz took it, and then another fastball in. So he sped the bat up now, J.J. Schwartz. J.J.'s looking fastball, been pounded inside twice. Now that really opens up the outside part of the plate for the breaking ball, change up, or maybe a fastball in the outside part of the plate. J.J. Schwartz, captain on this Florida team. He is tied for second in school history in career RBI. Great Brad Wilkerson, who is the SEC Player of the Year, will soon be passed by J.J. Preston Tucker owns the school record. Line shot. And Paul couldn't get to the bag quickly enough. But that's out number two. Yeah, love the idea of breaking ball after going fastball, fastball in, but you got to make a better pitch with two strikes. This ball's just kind of hanging right out over the plate, and a guy like J.J. Swartz with the experience that he has, four-year starter, hits this one too good. Luckily, Ethan Paul was there as he dove back. Will Dalton was in first. So Austin Langworthy at the plate with two down. Sophomore from Williston, Florida. One for five at three walks this weekend. And this one's launched to the gap in right center. Couple of gappers for Florida. Langworthy with an RBI double. And the Gators pick up right where they left off. They have a three-run first now. Oh, the Gators just aren't missing any mistakes right now. Hickman, first inning, not quite getting the ball where it needs to be. You can see Scott, the catcher, warned that ball on the inside part of the plate. Watch the location. I mean, belt high down the middle. And as hot as the Gator offense is right now, you just aren't getting away with those kind of mistakes. So an early visit for Mason Hickman, the freshman, from pitching coach Scott Brown. What is this conversation like? I think it's just calming down. I mean, look, the pitch count's up to 20 already. and He's getting hit around the ballpark pretty good at three spot here in the first inning. So it's about calming down, talking about mechanics a little bit. Because the ball, you can see where the ball is. He's missing up, out, over the plate. So the conversation is, look, we got to be down at the bottom of the knees. We got to be out of the center of the plate, and we got to be down at the bottom of the knees. And if you can't do that, it's going to be a short day for you. Two out hitting has been sensational for Florida this weekend. They've driven in 10 with two down. On the flip side, Vandy has a team hitting just 174 with two outs. That one goes off the catcher, Steven Scott, and Langworthy will move to third. Third wild pitch of the season for the freshman, Mason Hickman. Reigning SEC pitcher of the week is learning firsthand just how dangerous this Florida lineup is. There's the first changeup we've seen by Hickman, a good one. That's one way to get him off your fastball. 
It's Florida. That's been Florida's approach, I think, for most of the year and certainly this series. Hunting first pitch fastballs. Up the middle under Hickman's glove, another run across for the Gators on a Blake Reese RBI single. Two out hitting continues. And if you're Vanderbilt, you got to be thinking that you're living a nightmare. Yeah. Again, a one ball, two strike count. You see the location of that pitch? Not bad. I'd like to see it down a little bit more, one and two. But I tell you what, sometimes you got to give the hitters some credit. Boy, these, these Gator hitters are just on fire. Reese stays back. Breaking ball over the plate, it's it right back up the middle. And you're right, if you're Vanderbilt right now, you just can't slow the game down. The game's just too fast all the way around. And Hickman's given up four so far. We're not out of the first thing. Nobody warming up in the bullpen. Keenan Bell had a big home run. It's part of a seven run seventh last night for the Gators. They can put up crooked numbers in a hurry. Yeah, nice to have a guy like Bell down at the bottom of your lineup in the eight hole down there. The average isn't great. Hitting 227, but he can leave the yard. The home runs are there. 19 RBIs. He's been productive. Bell's driven in three this weekend. I don't know that we saw over the course of last season a dominating weekend like this from Florida. I mean, Vanderbilt is a top 10 team. Yeah, with, with a very good pitching staff. Yeah. And part of it, as you've mentioned over the course of this weekend, Florida was really banged up last year. Yeah. They had a lot of injuries to key players, and they probably weren't full strength until the Supers. Yeah, I mean, it was around the SEC tournament. They started kind of getting their guys back and getting the full strength, and those guys needed a few at-bats, and you're right. They got those at-bats at, at the SEC tournament. They got them in a regional. Then you saw them in a Super, and they were pretty much up to speed, and that's when the offense really started to click for them. I mean, you, you know Florida can pitch it every year. You know the defense. It's one of the top defenses not only in the SEC but in the country. And that's really how they stayed close and how they won. I mean, we're saying that, but that's how talented they were. They went 21-9 and in SEC play last year, tied for first place, and fought injuries for a lot of the year. Runner goes, pitch is fouled off. And now you throw I guess. Out. I mean, I don't know when I've seen. I mean, what, think about it. When's the last time you've seen a Florida offense this good in recent years? Been pretty good. But I mean, this good with the home runs doing what they're doing right now, the batting average, they're still in bases on top of it. A couple years ago, four years ago, when J.J. Schwartz had that, yeah. or that fantastic freshman year, their lineup had depth. I mean, he had 18 home runs, and he was hitting in the seven and eight hole. Right. So there was, there was depth to it, but I still don't remember it being this explosive. Into center, Alonzo Jones locates it. And puts it away. Florida sends eight to the plate in the first inning. The defending national champs slugging their way around the field. A couple of two out hits, and the Gators are chomping early. Four runs on four hits in the opening frame against the SEC Pitcher of the Week. Baseball world, here's why Florida's poised to be the number one team in the country when the new polls come out. Oregon State lost a series at home to a Utah team. They came into the weekend with only four wins on the year, so the Beavers' RPI will tumble. They're still a great team, but their pitching really struggled this weekend. Pitching hasn't been a struggle for a lot of teams. 17 no-hitters this season. It's the most since Aluminum Bats came around in 74. Florida State's Mike Martin, affectionately known by the number that he wears, 11, is closing in on the all-time win record. Yeah, how about that? How about the no-hitters, too? Are you kidding me? The all-time record way back when they used wooden bats is 19. 
So you got to think that's in jeopardy for the season as well. What's going on with the no hitters? Is pitching that much ahead of hitting? This is Steven Scott for Vanderbilt. Into right. Nelson Maldonado typically DHing this year. He handles that one. One down. Well, you got more baseball coming your way. This will be a really interesting matchup between two rivals. It should be a packed house Tuesday in Charlotte as the Carolinas go head to head. It's the Tar Heels versus the Gamecocks. North Carolina has won the last two meetings by a combined score of 35 to 5. That should be a fun one. I'll be in Charlotte for that one. Here's Pat DeMarco. A native New Yorker played high school ball in the Peachtree State. Langworthy towards the line. And the freshman DeMarco is retired. Yeah, South Carolina, speaking of them, they're coming off a big weekend against Tennessee. They swept Tennessee. To get their first SEC series victory of the year. Nice win for Texas A&M last night against Georgia to salvage a victory in that three-game series. A&M welcomes LSU to town. We'll have that game on Thursday from College Station. Alonzo Jones fouls off the first opportunity. Nothing in one. Well, he's been a versatile player in his time at Vanderbilt. Originally came in as a middle infielder and wasted no time as a freshman in playing all over the field. Jones just caught a piece of the breaking ball. Now a junior, but as a freshman All-American, he had starts at second, short, left and DH and just this weekend he's settled into a regular role in center field for Tim Corbin's squad now he's a special athlete you talk about pick him up and put him down I mean, 10 for 10 and stolen bases this year and really just trying to find a home you mentioned all the positions he's played he's trying to find an everyday position for him Full count to Alonzo Jones. Thirty-sixth round pick of the Cubs coming out of Columbus High School in 2015. High school, he was a perfect game All-American, played in the Under Armour All-America game. What's a good 60 time, right, folks? Uh, Football fans know the 4440 is world class speed. We'll discuss it. No matter how fast you run, if you get 96 thrown right by you, right? How about Tyler Dyson, the sophomore? Up to 96, Florida with a big lead, 4 to nothing. Some fantastic pitchers have come through these programs. A.J. Puck is on the shelf right now for the A's. First rounder in 2016. Dane Dunning, first rounder that same year. Alex Fajardo, first rounder last year. Got three and a half mil from the Tigers. Look at these guys. Sonny Gray starting for the Yankees today. Price just started for the Red Sox. BD, Kyle Wright. I mean, these programs have put. I mean, not so, only those guys going high in the draft when you, in relation to pro ball, as Cal Greenfield stands in. But those were elite college yeah. pitchers. And both of these programs seem to stockpile ours. It's almost not fair. And when you start running out guys like that, I mean, as consistently as Vanderbilt and Florida has done that, it seems like it's, you know, it's every year. It just seems like Florida's got three first rounders and Vanderbilt's got a couple of them, you know? You know, the harder part, the hardest part to that. You know, and Tim Corbin touched on that yesterday is getting them, getting them the, on campus. Mm -hmm. Good 
See Jackson Coar there. He pitched yesterday, of course, and won, and he's expected to be a first rounder this year. Brady Singer, who goes on Friday nights for Florida. They say he's a top five pick in the first round as well. We'll be speaking with Brady Singer a little bit later on. He doesn't have a choice. He does not have a choice. He pitched, now he gets a week off. He has to talk to us. That's the rules. <laughs> 4-0 Florida lead here in the second. If I punched out 11 a couple days ago, I'd be wanting to talk to anybody. Kyle Greenfield is a big White Sox fan. Grew up on Chicago's south side. Into no man's land, and it drops for a base hit for the Florida catcher. First SEC hit for Kyle Greenfield. It's just like Murphy's Law here for Vanderbilt. I mean, they just can't, you know, you can't catch a break. Ball almost fair in the first inning would have played it a run for him. It gets call foul. Now a ball. Pitcher make, Hickman makes an outstanding pitch around the inside part of the plate and jams. The greenfield, you see the Bermuda Triangle out there. Martin Kummer, Kaiser, the shortstop. Jones coming in from center. Nobody can come up with it. Florida and Vandy, great fielding teams. Entering the weekend, Florida led the nation in fielding percentage. They've not only committed a couple of errors, but there have been some balls that have gone unfielded or thrown away that have not shown up in the error column, mm -hmm. but have been misplays. Yeah, defense hasn't been great for either one of these teams. I mean, both teams have made a total of two errors. It has gone on the scoreboard, and you're right. Couple plays made by Vanderbilt early in the ball game yesterday would have put a completely different spin on the ball game, and they were unable to make it. Of course, Florida eventually put up the big crooked number seven in the seventh inning to really pull away. Slow start to the season for Deacon Lippitt. Missed the first 14 games due to suspension. Started 0 for 10. He's been on fire to take his average up above 300. 14 hits in his last 29 at-bats. Singled and scored in the first. Into center, Alonzo Jones will drift back. Still drifting, and he makes a catch against the fence. No win to speak of. Yeah, that ball just kept carrying and carrying into center field. Yeah, Deacon Lippin straight away center field. As an outfitter, you want to get all the way back as far as you can. Right about here, Jones thinks he has it easy. Then has to keep backpedaling. I tell you what, shows his athletic ability to get back right up against the wall. Right there, he thought he had it pretty easily, but the wind continues to push it out just a little bit. We're talking about 60 times last half inning. Lonzo Jones coming out of high school. Apparently was clocked at a 61760. That's like Billy Hamilton fast or faster. Cal Greenfield just taken off the base paths. He went through the bag at second. On the catch by Jones and then had to retreat to first. And I wonder if maybe he didn't go back and he hit the bag in the, on the, on yeah. the way back. If you pass it up, you got to touch second on your way back to first base. But Vanderbilt threw over and got him out. And look how key that is. A base runner off the base paths. And Maldonado singles <laughs> through the left side. Yeah, take a look at Green Phyllis. He touches the base right there. Couldn't see if he retouched it on the way back. Right. May have stepped over it. There's a throw back to the shortstop Kaiser, who steps on the bag. It's got to be a lonely walk back. Breaking ball in for a strike. Eight four put out. Back to 
back. Nice breaking balls by Hickman. See, those are down out of the middle of the plate. So Hickman's been able to get ahead in few occasions, but he has not been able to finish. Has not had the pitch to really get the Gators out with as of yet. Down the line foul. It's all about command. I don't care what level you pitch at, who you are, you got to be able to command your stuff, command your fastball, be able to throw your breaking ball, your changeup to the quadrants you want to throw it to. Quadrants? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, you know, you can make your fastball four different pitches. If you can ride it up and in, down and in, up and away, down and away, changing eye levels as you go. Ball block. But still couldn't get it down to second in time to take care of Maldonado. Nice read by Maldonado. They're the good teams, a good base runner. They read the ball out of the pitcher's hand. They follow it towards home plate while you're getting your secondary lead. And as soon as you realize it's a base runner, that ball's going to bounce. It's going to hit in the dirt before it gets to the catcher. Off and moving are you? Because you're betting the catcher can't pick it on one hop and then make a good throw to get you out. Maldonado did it perfectly. Jonathan Indy among the SEC leaderboards in a ton of offensive categories. 437 average. He came into this game, Ben, hitting 552 in SEC play. There he is, four different categories. He's first. He's also first in OPS, on base plus slugging. About 1,400, which is also, I understand, your SAT score. I was so bad at school, they wouldn't even let me take the SAT. <laughs> I only took the ACT. <laughs> India to short. Connor Kaiser gobbles it up. Gators uh, go down after hitting into a rare double play. It's a 4 0 Florida lead through two. SEC once again dominating the rankings in college baseball thanks to some fantastic individual performances. Casey Mai has got another win. Didn't walk anybody Thursday night against Missouri. Florida's better than last year. Certainly looks like it. They won it all last season, taking down LSU in an all-SEC final. Georgia took their series against Texas A&M. They're ranked for the first time in a half dozen years. Yeah, Bulldogs win their first three SEC series of the year. LSU won its series against Mississippi State. Freshman Mikhail Hilliard struck out nine, walked two, allowed three hits in six innings. Big win for LSU. Paul Maneri threw batting practice from hell on Tuesday, is what they called it. <laughs> and uh, the way I understand it, he gets as close as he can, and he just fires in two seamers. He like, does. hey, boys, let's go. I've seen, yeah, he gets almost on the dirt. And, like, he's 15 feet away, it seems like, and he's firing rockets. <laughs> It worked. They came out swinging the bats hot in game one against Mississippi State. Ground ball to third. You know, we're at the midway point in the season, Ben. You look at a team like Florida, and it's easy to see where they might have success headed towards the postseason. Vanderbilt might be a little bit harder to figure out. But I look at LSU as a team that will be better as the season goes on. I've learned never to doubt the purple mm. and gold, right? Even when they're young and inexperienced and have done, uh, dealt with a lot of injuries, you figure that they're going to get better every weekend. Yeah, Paul Maneri's been known for, you know, second half runs, late season, getting hot, playing your best baseball when it matters most, that kind of stuff. You know, quite frankly, LSU's not been very good this year. Now, it's a different team in a lot of ways as far as new players on the field. Injuries have been a big part of that as well. That Josh Smith, who I think is the heart and soul of that team at shortstop, has been down with a back injury for some time, you know. But they're going through a, str a stretch in their schedule right now that really favors them. I mean, it, all the teams in the SEC are good, but, you know, start off with Missouri. Vanderbilt beat them, but then they beat Mississippi State this weekend. And then you got Texas A&M, Tennessee, and South Carolina for LSU. So an opportunity to really, you know, kind of right the ship. 
Well, that's a nice pitch right on the outside corner. But, you know, if you're LSU, I, th I think it's more about hanging on and trying to get better, and maybe you get a couple of guys healthy towards the end. You see where they are, five and four in conference play. And so I think LSU's about where they thought they would be with a newer team. The question is, is can they find a way to turn it on in the second half? And how about your old battery mate, Mike Bianco, yeah. your former catcher in Ole Miss, just red. Hot. Are they better than you expected? Yeah, offensively, much better. You, 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 Ole Miss could always pitch it. Last year, they were one of the top pitching teams in the SEC. Base hit to left field for Austin Martin. A two-out single to extend the inning for Ethan Paul of Vanderbilt. Commodores down 4 nothing here in the third. But a lot like Florida's offense. You know, Florida, 13th out of 14 teams in offense last year. Ole Miss was the worst offensive team in the SEC. Not the case for them. They're banging it out of the ballpark. They're still in bases like they never have before. So it's a totally different offense for Ole Miss. And look, they're a big physical team. And Mike Bianco has done an outstanding job. And I'm tell you, the back end of that bullpen for Ole Miss, I, I think it's not only the best in the SEC, it may be the best in the country with Parker Caracy and Wolfolk and others that are down there. They're really good. That was a fantastic series that they just finished up against Arkansas. All three one-run games, if I'm not mistaken, right. including the finale yesterday. The crowds were just sensational once again at Ole Miss. That is a great place for a ball game. If you've never been, go. For nothing, number two, Florida leading Vandy. George has had a little bit of a soft schedule early on in conference play, not to take anything away from him, but they're getting ready to go through a buzzsaw portion of their series, including... Uh, Bulldogs get Vandy yeah. next. But then you get Kentucky, you have to go to Ole Miss. Yeah, so much of this league is catching teams at the right time. You know, you catch a team that's red hot, look, it's tough to win a series. You catch them at the right time because nobody really keeps it going through 30 games and through a 10-game series on weekends. You just can't really play your best baseball through an entire stretch. And so a lot of it depends on who you miss you know, throughout the season, because you don't play everybody, obviously, every year. And, and when you catch teams, that matters a lot. Ethan Paul laid down a sacrifice bunt his first time up. He has started every game at second base this season for Vanderbilt. Just below the strike zone. Remember, Paul was the masked man last year, warming up before the Kentucky series. He took a ball to the face, broke his nose, took a shot to the mouth, had to wear that plastic mask out there custom fit clear plastic mask Martin back to the bag he's got 11 steals on the year this is a Vanderbilt team of regulars made up primarily of freshmen and juniors. J.J. Blade has been a key player for him this season. He is out with an oblique injury. That occurred before game one of this series when he was taking swings in the batting cage. And Tim Corbin said, listen, he's not a soft, sensitive kid. He wants to play through everything. So if he's hurting and unavailable, it is a painful injury. We'll talk with J.J. a little bit later in this game. Talk about the makeup of this roster and all the young faces and new faces. Number one recruiting class in the country. Did you ever have an oblique injury? Yes, I did. I didn't know what an oblique was when it happened. They had to tell me it was a love handle. And I said, oh, I know what that is. But yeah, th those are tough to get through. I was in a spring training game and threw a pitch. And, and, and you know, talking to Bladey, like he described it, it felt like somebody sticking a, a screwdriver in your side. And, you know, so I threw one more pitch just to make sure. And sure enough. But that's, yeah, that's a tough one to rehab from because you can't really do any core work. You can't. I mean, if you sneeze, it hurts. If you cough, it hurts. It almost feels like a broken rib if you've ever had one of those. It just takes a little time. And as well as Blade, he was swinging it. You know, you hate to see him take some time off from, you know, not being able to hit. Yeah, six in the league in batting average. 372, also three home runs. So they're missing a key component of their batting order. Throughout this series, that's the same injury Zach Watson had, you know, and missed 10 games for LSU early in the year. Seems like you're hearing more and more oblique stuff than ever before. Two-two pitch. Wow, that almost got Paul. Now the command's been really good for Dyson up to this point. 
Hadn't walked a batter. Four strikeouts. Yeah, first trip through the batting order did not allow a hit. Runner on the move, and this ball is launched to right field, racing back Maldonado. He is at the fence, and that one is over. It's head gone. Two-run shot for Ethan Paul, and the doors are on the board. Well, how about Ethan Paul? Got in a predictable count. Got in a fastball count, 3-2. Watch the location of this pitch. I mean, center cut, belt high. Ethan Paul, watch this. Extension out in front, and that was a no-doubter to right center field. That was cleared every time. Those lucky fans got a souvenir. Just happened to be walking by the ballpark on this Easter Sunday. Talk about an easy egg hunt. Upstairs to Philip Clark now. That was the fourth home run allowed this season by Tyler Dyson. Clark struck out his first time up, and he sends this one to shallow right. Long run Maldonado will take care of it. But Vanderbilt gets on the scoreboard. Two runs on two hits. Fifth home run of the season for Ethan Paul. He is unmasked this season. And the junior second baseman takes it to the streets off the hop. 4-2, Florida. Hello, Florida up 4-2 on Vandy on this Sun Splash Sunday. Happy Easter, everybody. That guy is looking for one. Temperature in the 70 degree range here in the Sunshine State as the Gators look for a series sweep against a top 10 opponent. Defending national champs will be number one in the polls as soon as those are released. Here's Will Dalton, a double and two runs scored, or two runs driven in, I should say, for the Florida sophomore. Remember the movie Roadhouse, Ben? Oh, yeah. That was Patrick Swayze's mm -hmm. character name, Dalton. The double deuce, and this one deep to right. It's gone. Solo shot all the way to the door for Dalton. That is the fifth SEC home run for the sophomore. Just when Vanderbilt gets a little, little momentum back, they hit a two-run shot to draw the lead to half. All of a sudden, how about this? Not a bad pitch. That's center of the plate, but it's down. Will Dalton goes oppo, and I'm talking about straight away right field for his 11th large one of the year. Now, that's some juice right there. When you go out opposite field like that. And this one's launched on a line to left. What a catch made by Martin against the fence. Top end speed to take it away. That was elite all the way around. How did he get there that fast? Well, you talk about a great read. We talked about these two teams, two of the top defensive teams in the SEC. Watch the left fielder Martin off and running right away and lunges out at the last second to rob. J.J. Swartz of a for sure double. Yes, sir. You gotta love that when you own a bump. Here's Austin Langworthy. He's doubled home a run. Mm. Better than a chalk outline. <laughs> I guess you can find momentum in any area of the game, right? You get a great defensive play. Absolutely. You know, we hear about the shutdown inning, and I think it gets talked about a little bit too much, but there's certain times when it is 
critical that you go out and do that. And as tough as it's been for Vanderbilt, you know, to trouble scoring runs, Florida's been all over them since this series began. You know, when you cut the lead in half, you needed to go out and put that zero up. And boy, Dalton goes opposite field. Now Florida grabs most of the momentum right back. It's think of the two outcomes that could have occurred on that play. I mean, you, you get a home run and then a laser off the wall. J.J. Schwartz is standing at second base. Mason Hickman might not be long for this game. Mm -hmm. This one golf to the gap. Alonzo Jones will get cut off. Austin Martin was there to make the catch right behind him. Two down. Austin Martin's like, hey, dude, yeah, I can go both ways to get it. <laughs> I got it. You take it. One of those deals. Obviously, center fielder has priority. You know, I got to think Alonzo Jones never really called that ball. Jones is the junior. They would call that a near miss in the aviation industry. Yes. Here's Blake Reese. Singled home a run his first time up. Gators sent eight to the plate in the first inning. It was a 3-1 game in the seventh inning mm -hmm. yesterday. 2-1 game in game one of this series going into the seventh inning. It didn't feel that close in the seventh inning yesterday. It kind of felt like Florida was in better control. Than, uh, and, of course, they were when they put up a seven spot. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, it just seemed like Florida's just been just firing on all cylinders and even it was a close game. And that's a disappointing thing for Vanderbilt. And I think if you're Coach Corbin, it's growing pains with a very young team. You know, you're talking about you started five freshmen as many as the lineup, but sometimes this year you got four in the lineup in all three games of this series. And they got to find a way if you're, if you're Vanderbilt to grow up in a hurry and finish. You know, figure out because, again, the first two ball games, they were right there until late in this ball game, and then two big explosion by the Gators in the seventh inning in both of these games was the difference. And that means growing up from a pitching standpoint, a defensive standpoint, an offensive standpoint. that one right there. 2-2 two, two count. That's the count you want to make it happen because you're not in a predictable count on 2-2 two, two, and you paint a fastball just on the outside part of the plate. I think Tony Walsh, home plate umpire, maybe had it a little bit down. This one launched to right. It is off the fence. They are hitting him hard. Reese on his way to second. Strong throw. And Kaiser's tag is evaded by Reese who is two for two with a double. Three two count again predictable count ball left in the middle of the plate. Blake Reese with his second base hit. How about DeMarco quickly off the wall throws it in. And not quite in time. So Tim Corbin takes note of how hard these balls have been hit off Mason Hickman in this inning. Dalton's home run was launched. J.J. Schwartz's shot to left was hauled in by Martin on a run. Langworthy flew out to deep left center. Reese with a ringing double. And so they go to the bullpen for the first time, and Hickman's day is done in Gainesville. Tonight at 6 o'clock right here on the SEC Network, they'll be on Rocky Top for a top 10 softball showdown. Georgia and Tennessee, second game of a three-game series. Tennessee, a walk-off hit by pitch in the bottom of the seventh inning. Game number one, that was a 1-0 win on a walk-off hit by pitch. How about that? First shutout loss of the season for Georgia. That game also streamed live on the ESPN app. Reigning SEC Pitcher of the Year. Learned firsthand just how tough and deep this Florida batting order is. 
Mason Hickman, freshman, goes two and two-thirds, eight hits and five runs. And one walk and one K. Didn't miss many barrels this inning, so he hands it off to Jackson Gillis, 6'3", sophomore out of Wilmington, Mass. Seventh appearance of the season for Gillis, who struck out 22 in just 15 innings of work. Yeah, I love the strikeouts for innings pitch. Not too happy about the walks, though. Ten walks and 15, just a little bit too much. But the ability to strike you out, the stuff is there. I mean, it's a fastball from the left side. It's going to get into the 90s, low 90s with a breaking ball to change up as well. Yeah, if you're Hickman, I mean, you, you look at your outing and you say, well, I only walked one guy. But you're right, he didn't miss the fat part of the barrel too much because the command of his stuff just wasn't there. And you can go back and look at four or five of the hits. You know, he got the plus counts a few times, but he left balls really up out over the plate with two strikes, one and two a couple of times, two and two a couple of times. You just can't live up there with a team like Florida as hot as they are right now. Because I think I think we're seeing Florida's offense as good as I've seen it in I don't know how many years. I mean, they are really firing on all cylinders right now, and you just can't make mistakes right now. Gillis will dig in in this lefty-lefty matchup against Keenan Bell, who is 0 for 1 with a fly out to left. After the righty Greenfield, it'll be another lefty Lippet at the top of the order for Florida. It's a 5 to 2 Gators lead. Not that anyone would turn the success down, but how can Florida sustain this over the course of a very long season? We're only just past the midway point this weekend. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they can continue to hit it this well. I think they're pitching. I think their defense will be steady for them like it's been the last couple of years. But I don't know if, you know, things are really just going in their favor offensively right now. They're all swinging it. You know, because it's very seldom you get all nine guys seem to be swinging it well at the same time. Typically, you get three guys that are hot Three guys that are swinging it okay, the three guys scuffing a little bit, but it seems like most everybody in this Florida lineup is really finding the barrel more and more. And I think everybody understands over the course of 60 games, you know, that you're going to have some ups and downs. You're going to have stretches where you swing it and play absolutely well. Then you'll have some stretches where you don't. I was talking to a major league hitting coach one time a couple years ago, and he said, Tom, I feel like my job is that of a plate spinner. So I got nine different plates in the air, mm -hmm. and I got a couple that are spinning really good. And when I spend more time with them and those are going good, I got a couple more that are wobbling behind me. I got to rush over and fix those plates and get them right. spinning again. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. I mean, it, typically that's what you're going to have. A third of your lineup really swinging it well. A third just kind of doing the average, and a third that are, that are scuffing a little bit. But not the case with the Gators right now. Dribbler foul, still one and two. But see, where Florida can beat you is with the pitching. You see, because they got the three first rounders there, and they got the good bullpen, and they got the defense too. And so while their hitting can get cold from time to time, like it did last year for a lot of the season, they can still beat you because of what they do so well defensively. Here's the one-two pitch to Bell. Big swing and a miss. Big time pitch from Gillis to end the inning. A home run from Will Dalton. He is two for two. We've talked about Florida's hitting. We'll talk pitching with Brady Singer right after this. Looking for a sweep, a 5-2 lead over Vandy. Tom Hart alongside Ben McDonald. We're joined down in the Florida dugout by game one starter and winner, Brady Singer. Hey, happy Easter, buddy. Hey, happy Easter to y'all. Yeah, welcome to the ballpark. Um, this is a Florida offense, Ben and I were just talking about it, that is just cruising right now. What kind of confidence does that give this pitching staff when you take the mound knowing that they could explode for nine runs any game? Yeah, guys, it's really awesome, you know. Um, especially this year, you know, kind of our last year, we want to go out with a bang, and, you know, they're just they're hammering baseballs, and, you know, it's helping all of us pitchers out. Yeah, it's got to be a good feeling for you guys because, I mean, quite frankly, your offense struggled, you know, for the first half of the season last year. I know you guys had some injuries, and, of course, I know how that is on the bump. 
you go out there and you know one or two runs can beat you, so it puts a little extra pressure on you as a pitcher not to give up runs early. But with this kind of offense, I think that would relax you guys on the bump a little bit more, just knowing if you do have a bad inning and give up a couple, hey, this offense quite capable of coming back with a crooked number. Right, exactly. You know, for example, I gave up that home run on Friday night. You know, they came back, and I think they, you know, they put four, you know, back on the board for me. So that's, you know, it's just incredible to watch them. This is Julian Infante to lead off the fourth inning for Vanderbilt. Showing bunt, and he puts it into the dirt. How did you guys prepare for Vanderbilt? Different than some other teams in regard to how much they run? Yeah, you know, that's just something that Sully told us, you know, before the series, and I watch, you know, watching video. They can run. You know, I think their first, you know, probably four, uh, you know, guys can run. You know, those freshmen are really quick. You know, you got Alonzo Jones at the end of the, at the, end of the lineup that could run. But, um, you know, just holding runners on and, you know, just, you know, making sure the defense knows that they can run. And how does that affect you? I, I know you, you don't want to be too quick to home play because then you get out of your rhythm and what you do. So kind of what's your approach when you face a team that can really pick on you? Varying your moves a little bit, stepping off a little bit more maybe? Yeah, you know, just picking off a little bit, you know, more than I used to do. I feel like I don't pick off a lot, but, you know, I picked off more, you know, Friday night than I have all year. Julian Infante at the plate for Vandy. He is three for nine this weekend. One of the juniors on this uh, Vandy team. Got a lot of juniors and a lot of freshmen. One ball and two strikes. Brady in Florida went on a remarkable run all the way to the first national championship last year. As Infante sent a little pop-up to shallow center. And the marketing team, Brady, put together a nice little commercial here recently with the pitchers out on the golf course. It was a playoff of what you did in the postseason. Let's watch. This is great. Oh, my. Oh. See ya. That's good contact, baby. Hey, Byrne, I found yours. Your ball's going to be ball's right over there. Oh, yeah. Let's see Jackson in the bunker. Yep. Bunker in the bunker. <laughs> Beach party. Mark coming out of the bunker. You got ways to go. Out of the bunker. Then you're, you're on the Give me a good roll. Here. Oh, yeah, you're pulling it. <laughs> oh, no. Here we go again. <laughs> Come on, man. You're acting like a child. <laughs> Relax, dude. It's not actual rain. It's just a <laughs> What you got against water, man? Uh, it was awesome. It was a playoff. Folks aren't aware it's a playoff of uh, what happened to you in the Super Regional when they pulled you off the field thanks mm. to Mother Nature. Against uh, Wake Forest, it, I thought that was really neat. That you were able to laugh at yourself with yeah. that. What, what was your thoughts when the marketing team first came to you with the idea that that would be the spot? Oh, I thought it was hysterical. You know, acting out, I was like, you know, this might be dumb. This might not look good for me. But you know, when it when it was all said and done, it was really funny. It was really fun to kick a few things over. Yeah, you weren't like very happy in that ball game coming <laughs> off the mound. I happened to be watching that game, and uh, yeah, you, you did not want to leave the mound that mm. night. But you guys have had a lot of rain and the competitiveness juices, all that's flowing and everything, so I totally get it. Yeah, no, for sure. Seven innings Friday against Vandy. This one's popped up into the seats. We, I was here last weekend, and we're watching you guys in person again, and you're coming off of a national title. You had a first-rounder uh, as an ace with Fiedo in front of you, and you, your staff is fantastic again. The offense is, is way ahead of where you were last year. Is it possible that this Florida team is better than last year's team? Um, yeah, I think anything's possible. You know, we're definitely missing Alex. Um, you know, he was a key part of our success last year. But, no, I think for sure, you know, anything's possible. And I think we're really, really good, especially with the offense, like y'all were talking about, doing really good at the you know, beginning of this year. Besides being a strike thrower and a first-rounder, what did Alex Fiedo bring to the rotation that you are trying to replicate or take over from a leadership perspective with this staff? Competitiveness, you know, he was a huge competitor on, you know, especially on Friday night, getting us, you know, started off on the right foot and uh, getting a win under our belt, you know, setting us up for Saturday and Sunday. But, um, no, he was a really good teammate and he was an awesome dude. Brady Singer, thanks for your time. We appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Y'all Hope take you care. don't get rained on anytime soon. It's a one, two, three framework by his teammate, Tyler Dyson. We go to the bottom of the fourth, 5 2 Florida. play game three of the series between Vandy and Florida run saving catch made in left field up against the wall by Austin Martin looked like Aston Martin covering a lot of ground Boy, he got a wonderful jump on that and runs it down as a starting pitcher you always like that little D behind you first pitch strike to Cal Greenfield you like uh, 
Brady's answers, what he gave us. I mean, Alex Fajardo was a very emotional mm -hmm. pitcher. It seemed like he was better when he was coming off the mound, pumping his fist. Yeah, and I, I wish we'd had a little more time because I wanted to ask him. You know, he was in the rotation, obviously, the last couple of years. But what's the difference? You know, I mean, it, weekend rotation is tough. But when you go from a Sunday or a Saturday into a Friday night roll like Fido did, I mean, it's totally different. There's a lot more pressure, I think, because you're you're the tone setter. You, you set the, the tone for your club for the entire series. And if you get off to a good start and win game one, of course, we all know that obviously that sets you up to win the series. And so that, that was going to be my next question to him. But, you know, you can see he, he certainly got the intensity from Fido, because Fido was like that a lot, too, and you see a lot of singer in Fido. Take me back to your freshman year. Were you the Friday night guy from the minute you stepped on? No. No, I was a guy coming out of basketball that missed half the baseball season, and so I was really a guy that just kind of pitched in relief a little bit and got one midweek start along the way and, you know, got some big reps at, you know, toward the end of the season. Well hit to center. This will push Jones back, but plenty of real estate. Kyle Greenfield retired, one down. But then it went to the Friday night roll, you know, my sophomore and junior year. And, it, and it's a different, you know, you just feel the weight of your club a little bit more because, you know, if you have success and go out well in game one, it really sets you up for the next two games and win the series. Back to the top of the order in Deacon Lippitt now. So then the SEC was just as good, if not, uh, it might be a little bit deeper now. But yeah. obviously when you're playing in the late 80s, it was the premier conference. Mm -hmm. How did that help you when you got to the big leagues, being a Friday night starter in the SEC? Well, I mean, me personally, being able to pitch on Friday night, you, know, you pitch in front of the nice crowds, you know. And I always took my basketball experience, too. And being, in, you know, when you go play in Kentucky, which, you know, you do a lot of games in Kentucky, there's a lot of people there. So I had been in front of some people before. You know, it wasn't yeah. a huge shock to me to go perform in front of, of a big audience, if you will. You know, but I think the SEC, more than any other conference around, prepares you for that because, you know, We've always said Friday nights in the SEC, to me, is very equivalent to double-A baseball. I mean, it's right in that range. You get the aces going, and, you know, when you start matching up the Vanderbilts and Floridas and the Ole Misses and the LSUs around the country, you know, and in the SEC, it's, it's big-time baseball. I would argue, though, one point with you is that the pressure is much greater pitching in the SEC on a Friday night than any random Texas League or Southern League start. No doubt. Not just from a media perspective, but a fan perspective. You can go out there and double-A and do whatever mm -hmm. you want, and family and friends are likely really the only ones who know about it. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, if you're Ole Miss, Mississippi State, a team, South Carolina, would you, you put eight or 10,000 every, I mean, there's no way in the minor leagues you're going to play in front of that many people, mm -hmm. you know, and so. Or with so much on the line. Exactly, you know, and, and the minor leagues just, while it's good baseball and everybody wants to get there and play it, it's, you know, enjoy your college experience, man. Don't be in a hurry to move on from this because it's a special time in your lives. Two and two to Deacon Lippitt. <laughs> Won't leave the infield. Infante has it. By the way, Dodgers pitcher Alex Wood, who played his college ball at Georgia, was an all-star last year and went eight innings of shutout ball against the Giants in his start the other night. He always told me that Friday nights in the SEC, whether that was pitching in Baton Rouge or in Starkville, got him used to that pressure-filled atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So that when he got to the big leagues, it wasn't – I mean, obviously it's a step from a competition sure. standpoint. I'm not no, saying I that. No, I know what you're saying, but it's not It's not It's not overwhelming. It's right. not overwhelming. I mean, you, you, exactly. You feel like you belong a little bit because you say, hey, I, I've been there and I've done that before. That one hit him. Hey, just caught know. a stitch. And, of course, the proof is, you know, we look on rosters. As we showed yesterday the, the guys are in the big <laughs> leagues right now, right? I think it's 85 SEC guys on rosters. It's breaking ball from Gillis right inside on Maldonado and just nicks him. Vandy will send two former doors. Vandy boys getting starts on the mound in the big leagues today. Mike Miner signed a lucrative deal in the offseason with Texas. He's pitching against the defending world champs Houston today. And Sonny Gray takes the mound for the Yankees. Here's Jonathan India. This guy looks like a future big leaguer, doesn't he? Oh, no doubt. Yeah, I think and you talked about big league. You know, India is a guy that was on some people's, some scouts' radars. Is obviously going to get drafted his junior year this year. But I'll tell you what, if he continues to have this kind of year, you could see him possibly go into the top three or four rounds without a doubt. I mean, you talk about golden spikes. He's got to be at the top of the list of that. See the numbers on the year. When you lead in the SEC in batting average, you're up there in home runs. He was a 26th round pick of the Brewers coming out of high school. 
Yeah, and showed signs along the way his first couple of years. But still, if you go back to the numbers from last year, he hit 274, six homers, 34 RBIs. I don't think anybody saw 430-something coming at the plate. By the way, speaking of the Golden Spikes Award, Player of the Year in college baseball, there's some names you may not be familiar from a national perspective that are certainly playing their way into the conversation. Certainly some, some guys out west. And uh, Andrew Vaughn of Cal has had a tremendous run. Illinois has got a kid who's hitting 500 with great power. And uh, this Illinois team looks like a regional, perhaps second, reg uh, second weekend team. Of course, they hosted Vandy a few years ago in the Supers. And that was the day when Dansby Swanson went 1-1. Brent Spillane is the Illinois slugger that will be in those conversations. He's hitting 500 with 13 doubles and 14 home runs. Wow. And this ball is launched towards the gap. It is into the bullpen and off the palm tree. Two run home run for Jonathan India, his 11th long ball of the year for the best hitter in the best conference. Just as Will Dalton did going off over to his 11th, Jonathan India says, hey, you know what? I can do the same thing. Love this approach. Hands go first, barrel behind it. And I mean, squares it up to right center field, almost on a line. That's impressive. like one of my golf shots bouncing off of a say, tree. With the Masters coming up in just a few days away, it almost looks like a Tiger Woods two iron right there. By the way, Tiger announced on his website he will not be participating in the Masters really? this year. Yeah. Breaking news from the New York Times. Could that be an April Fool's joke, maybe? I, they posted it last night, so that that was the 31st. That's not That wouldn't be fair, right? No, I guess. Gosh, I thought he was healthy. He looked healthy, playing well. Here's Will Dalton, two for two with a double and a home run. Surely the New York Times didn't get fooled, did they? Stop. <laughs> That's right up your alley. Two and one now to Dalton. When do we do a split screen with Will Dalton and Patrick Swayze from the double deuce? Mm. Three balls and a strike. By the way, going to Texas A&M this week, I might run into Chuck Norris at dinner again like I did a couple years ago. Did you really? Yeah. Chuck Norris doesn't go to dinner. Dinner comes to Chuck Norris. What to say? Yeah, of course. Uh, I don't know if you remember the story. Rob Childress, his son, and Chuck Norris' son were on the same Little League team. Really? And Rob Childress left practice one day and turned to his wife and said, isn't it funny? That guy's got the same name as that actor. <laughs> kind of looks <laughs> like him. His wife goes, hey, hey, pal, that's Chuck Norris. That is him. Payoff pitch. Low and away. J.J. Schwartz is 0 for 2. Uh, Twitter fooled me. They got you? Yeah, they got me. Somebody retweeted an article from last March 31st. Ah. So, 
Got him. <laughs> yeah. Just another example of me being an idiot. <laughs> I never know what that to believe. That might be the yeah. greatest comeback. I mean, besides Ben Hogan coming back from a massive car wreck and breaking just about every bone in his body, right. Tiger Woods can come back and win the Masters. Yeah. That might be the greatest athletic comeback in history. No doubt. It'd be fun to watch. I mean, like him. If you don't like him, that's great, too. But, I mean, to me, he's good for the game of golf. I mean, it's exciting. More people are going to tune in, if he, especially if he has a chance to win it, because it yeah. is a, a wonderful story if he can. But the play's been, I haven't followed it closely, but the play's been pretty solid the last couple of weekends. I thought we uh, had a great Cinderella story with Loyola of Chicago, but it didn't work out for him last night in the Final Four. By the way, Villanova hit 18 threes and knocking out Kansas. That'll do it. What's hotter right now, Villanova basketball or Florida baseball? Florida bats, yeah. That's a close race. I mean, Jonathan Indy, I, I don't know. It's impressive to watch. And I don't know how you pitch him at this point, you know? Mm hmm the only ball I haven't seen is a plus fastball in on the hands on the inside part of the plate. I haven't seen him cover that yet. Most everything's been kind of middle of the way, but more impressively, I think, you know, looking at him and watching him, he's a totally different hitter. I mean, the ability to see it a little bit deeper this year, drive it the other way, with not just drive it, but drive it with home run power like he's doing. Not offering it bad pitches for the most part this year. 2-0 to J.J. Schwartz. What's that like in a pitcher's meeting when you come upon a, a name in the batting order that's just red hot and you don't know if you can get the guy out? Well, I mean, that's, you know, that's when you don't pitch to him if you don't have to. You know, you got a base open, you, you put him on because, you, you know, you can't let him beat you in a certain situation. But, it, you know, that's where Florida gets you, you know, because you got India, then and Dalton's got 11 behind him, Schwartz has got seven behind him. And so it's like if you pitch around one, the other one's sitting there waiting on you. Three balls and a strike. Big swing for Schwartz. Full count. There's ball four. Back to back walks. Dalton aboard. Schwartz behind him. JJ Schwartz tugging at that knee a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was swollen up a little bit from yesterday. Kind of looked like a hyperextension. Yeah. Was bat bat late in the game yesterday. The good news is he's still, you know, he's good enough to be in the lineup. Maybe not squat and catch 150 pitches on the day, but. It's a Florida team. It's Austin Langworthy's teams. And it's 24-5. and five. They'll be the number one team in the country with the new polls tomorrow. They have plenty of breathing room. And so not that you would wish injury upon anyone, but it's not the worst thing in the world that Cal Greenfield gets to start behind the plate. They had great depth at that position last year. Yes, they did. Langworthy doubled home a run in the first. Mike Rivera was their starter for the most part last year. Mark Colt Silvari, who got drafted, was another one of their catchers. He was really the third string guy, and J.J. Schwartz would see time behind the plate or at first base. And great flexibility in that position, and they needed it due to a lot of injuries they went through. Inside, all the way to the backstop off of Scott's glove. 
Third wild pitch from a Vandy pitcher today. Dalton to third. Schwartz behind him moves to second. I think any time you can rest your regular guys occasionally, just give them a few innings off every now and then. You see this ball gets right by Scott. He thought he had it in his glove. Goes back to the backstop. Especially your starting pitchers. I mean, because you don't, you know, you only got so many bullets in that arm in a year. As far as you know, your best stuff. You're going to reach a teetering point towards the end of the season where not many pitchers feel like they feel in 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 April, you know, or March. And so, anytime you get a big lead, you know, take Florida for example. You know, Singer or Cole or Dyson. You know, anytime. Suddenly gets a big lead, you know, when it's 10 to 2 in the fifth inning. I think it's a good idea to get them out of the ball game. Let them get the five innings in, pick up the W, but then save some bullets for later on. Because you want your guys, you want your horses. You want them to be as fresh as you can keep them when it matters the most. Of course, it matters the most in postseason. Some teams are different. Some teams have to. You know, it matters most right now. you got to win to have a chance even to get the postseason. But when you're talking about Florida, postseasons are coming. They're looking right now like the number one national seed. Of course, the most important thing is to be a top eight national seed. Right. Fouled straight back. Big change coming in the NCAA postseason for the first time. Just like softball has been doing for years, they're going to seed the top 16 teams in the tournament. In the past, it would be the top eight national seeds, and they could maneuver and, and fit things around. And there will still be some variability on the seed line, trying to avoid certain matchups and to, uh, to meet certain parameters. But that means you'll have a much more balanced tournament in the postseason. It won't be decided as much by geography as it has in the past. Remember, Clemson and South Carolina seem to be right. matched up every year in the Super Regionals for years and years. Which some people liked and some people didn't like, you know. I mean, it's it creates some really nice rivalries when you do it geographically, I guess. It's great for television. Sure. You get great crowds, but it's not fair for the teams. You've earned that seed you've earned mm -hmm. that spot and so I think the point is that this year there is real value in your seed line because if you're the number one seed and you get the 16 seed on paper that's an advantage and it should make the path to Omaha easier right or on paper easier yes of course the, you know, yeah. the factors in is who's hot who's hot right now Bases loaded for Blake Reese. Ever since the home run by Jonathan India, Gillis has had a little bit of trouble. You like the stuff. I mean, the fastball's been up to 93. Pretty good breaking ball, but three walks in a row. All coming on full counts. Mm, Reese swinging. Two and two. That's how you know you got pretty good stuff. You get in a plus count, you throw your heater, and a guy swings at it like that. You don't need the spin rate to tell me anything. He's got a pretty good fastball. Scott Brown is the Vanderbilt pitching coach. You mentioned spin rate. He does a great job in his secret lab, the pitching lair that is underneath the stands at Vandy's football stadium adjacent to the ballpark. Interesting conversation with him pregame today. Fourth straight 3-2 count. 
and it's fouled off. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things, you know, about guys and their fastballs and how it rotates and how some guys' balls will stay up. Even though it's a two-seam fastball, it, it tends to ride on the hitter. And he was explaining that to us. He has a couple of those guys where they access the way the two-seamer rotates. It makes the ball appear to actually ride like a four-seamer normally would. So you see some guys that don't. And that's valuable information for a pitcher to know that one fastball spins better than the other as far as staying on plane a little bit longer. Strike three called, and the Gators leave the bases loaded. But they get two runs across on one hit, and it was a big one. An opposite field blast for Jonathan India, who is on his own planet right now. Vanderbilt Tom Hart Ben McDonald up in the booth happy to be joined in the visitors dugout by sophomore JJ Bladay a little banged up on the uh, on the side for this series hope to see you back in the field sometime soon mm -hmm. but let's talk about this season for Vanderbilt specifically you guys you're the rare sophomore that's in there on a regular basis you got a bunch of juniors and a bunch of freshmen how did you guys get this top class acclimated to SEC baseball when you first met all these dudes in the fall you know uh, just goes back to the fall uh, we had uh, a lot of guys coming in, didn't know really how to, uh, you know, I wouldn't say approach it, but, you know, get these guys going as much as we thought we would. But, um, you know, right now we're just uh, um, letting them play, let them do their thing, and, you know, got them along the way. So really just, like, take them in like, as, like, a younger brother. What was the one thing that you learned last year as a freshman you wish you would have learned earlier about playing in this league? Um, honestly, just taking every game and separating it completely, whether it's one pitch, one play, um, taking every game and just completely separating from one another. Speaking about last year, J.J., how about the turnaround for you this year? 372 with the batting average. What, what's been the difference? Is it experience more than anything? I mean, yeah, it's getting, uh, you know, you're a little bit more comfortable this year. And doing what I just said, you know, really separating each at bat, each, uh, each game from one another. When you talk about experience, that means the bat you got, maybe the bat you get in summer, your summer program as well. Yeah, absolutely. Newport, I was in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, great program, great organization, and uh, you know it was just fun to be a part of that, and uh, you know get a chance to play every day, see what you need to work on, see uh, see uh, what your you know your your faulties are, and just uh, trying to get better. Hey JJ, hey, hang on with me here mm -hmm. through this storyline with Alonzo uh, Jones at the plate. Do you know who Mo Berg is? Mo Berg. Mo Berg was a major league catcher, and uh, he played his college ball at Yale, but he's better known while he was a major league ball player for being a spy. Really? Yeah. Line drive to right field, and Jones is aboard. So with that, let me ask you, do you really speak Russian? I speak a little Russian. I don't speak fluent Russian, but uh, I do speak a little bit. My, my heritage is Russian on my dad's side. My mom's side is Czechoslovakian. So... Um, I grew up going to my uh, my grandparents, and my my granddad would uh, teach me a little bit, and we would speak back and forth. What can you drop on us here? Um, zdrasvi de drug, kako je vajce, menja se vod Jeffrey Joy kim vladaike. Okay, now you have to translate <laughs> yeah, for yourself. I'm, I'm lost. Just, uh, hello, how are you doing, friends? Um, my name is JJ, and that's really about it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, you might be the modern day Mo Berg. I mean, if you I don't know speak, about that. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. you know, Vandy gra degrees can get you a lot of places, open a lot yeah, of doors. Absolutely. See, absolutely. He's got the only baseball card that's displayed in yeah. the CIA. Yeah. Tommy, you didn't get that story from the same place you got the Tiger Woods story, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just asking. I want to make sure. Oh, no, I mean, it sounded good. It does sound good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one pitch is inside. Um, a little bit more about you. You were a great swimmer in high school, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still six records at Titusville High School here in Florida. What was your specialty? What were your events? I was a sprinter, so I was a I was a freestyler, and uh, I didn't like didn't like doing mid distance or distance. So I like to get in there and get then getting right back out. <laughs> how does uh, being a swimmer, an elite swimmer, how does that complement the skills on a baseball diamond? Um, I mean, just it keeps keeps your edge. You know, it keeps you competitive. I mean, it's a little bit different because it's not as much of a team sport as baseball is. Mm -hmm. 
But, um, you know, it's unique in its own way. And um, the good thing about it was you know, it really kept you in shape, um, especially the arm. You know, and you're, you're constantly conditioned and, you know, just ready to go. Never thought about that before, the, the specifically shoulder strength. Does Absolutely, that plays yeah. into it? Yeah. Absolutely. Shoulder, lat, everything. That makes sense. Yeah. A, you know, a lot of the rehab you do after shoulder surgeries is for pitchers is underwater with paddles and stuff, resistant yeah. type exercises. So certainly, you know, by, by swimming a lot, you would think it would certainly benefit the, the cuff muscles, rotator muscles, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. J.J. Blade chatting with us. Connor Kaiser is at the plate. We talked a lot about Connor. He's a great two-sport player. He's mm -hmm. a great uh, AAU basketball player growing up in the Kansas City area. What stands out to you when you watch Connor at short? Oh, he's so consistent. I mean, just right there. He's uh, he's consistent at the plate. He's consistent. Um, anything hits him and on the base pass as well. He's just a, a great kid and a great leader for our team. I know it hasn't been a great weekend for this Vandy team. Florida's one of the top teams in the nation, and you guys are trying to avoid being swept. What's the mood around the program right now, and how do you, as a guy who's got a year of experience under your belt, how do you try to keep the uh, spirits high in this scenario? You know, right now it's just keeping our head up and, um, you know, worrying about ourselves, not the opponent. And, you know, no matter win or lose, we're just trying to get better. Uh, you know, no matter the result, we're always trying to get better. Can you say Tiger Woods is going to play in the Masters in Russian? <laughs> no, I cannot do oh, that. Oh, man. I was really I mean, hoping. Uh, nah, I can't. Okay, work nah. on it. We'll have you yeah. on again later Practice in the year. Practice a little bit. We're going to get you again. <laughs> Sounds good, guys. J.J. Blade. Hey, thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. Hope to see you back on the field real soon. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. You bet. The top of the fifth inning. Vandy's got two aboard here with nobody out. The, the Russian. That's yeah, I like that. Now. That's pretty cool. I wanted to ask him about Corpse. You know, does Corpus oh. ever smile on game day? Ever. He's a pretty intense guy. A very intense guy. Corbs chatting with Harrison Ray now with two on, and Tim Corbin sensing that this could be an opportunity. Pinch hitting Ray for Gonzalez, who is 0 for 4 this weekend. Tyler Dyson has thrown 64 pitches. You know, certainly the best opportunity they've had, first and second, and nobody out. They were able to cut the lead in half on a two-run homer back in the top of the third. But, of course, Florida answers right back in the bottom of the fourth. Tony Walsh joins the discussion. We'll break it up. Seven to two lead for Kevin O'Sullivan's Gators. I may have just outed J.J. Blade. Maybe he is working towards being a spy. Now that's over now. Everybody knows. Yeah. I'm just ruining everything today. <laughs> On the way to the ballpark, I stole a bunch of Easter eggs, too. <laughs> yeah, Mo Berg played back in the 40s late 30s and 40s. He skipped spring training one year to go to law school at Columbia. In 1943, he joined the OSS, which is a precursor to the CIA. One ball, two strikes. He went on a tour of Tokyo with a bunch of baseball players, big league players, mm -hmm. back in the early 40s, late 30s, early 40s. And he had a camera with him. And so prior, remember Doolittle's Raiders, they led one of the uh, air raids in Japan. Prior to that, he met with the United States government and showed them his footage of Tokyo Bay. This is a guy who was catching in the big leagues. Wow. Kevin O'Sullivan kind of looks like a secret agent right now. The men in black and gold have loaded the bases here in the fifth. Yeah, Dyson's just been cruising. I mean, not a walk going into this inning. Five punch outs. Only four hits allowed going to the, even to this point. Two hits allowed coming in. All of a sudden now, the stuff's just not been the same. Command has left. So hasn't walked anybody, but he just hit Harrison Ray. 
Prime opportunity for Vandy. Austin Martin singled in the third. Yeah, velocity's still good. That ball at 93. He's been anywhere from 92 to 96. That's Tyler Dyson today. There's a look at the bullpen. Bottom half of some pitcher. We can tell you he's a righty, and that's about all. Told that's Jack Leftwich getting loose. That's a big out. And now double plays in order after Martin strikes out. Yeah, gets ahead. See the catcher, Greenfield, around the outside corner. Four seamer just knocking some paint right off the outside corner. Now the command seems to be coming back. Sometimes those fifth innings are tough to get through for a starting pitcher. You look on the scoreboard and you got a nice lead and you go, okay, if I can just get through the fifth inning, man, I'm good to go. And you put a little extra pressure on yourself. You start doing some things maybe that you didn't do before. Tyson only at 71 pitches. It looks like Sully's headed to the mound. Yep. So it'll be 71. They've got back-to-back -back lefties coming up and Ethan Paul and Philip Clark. And so Kevin O'Sullivan's going to play the percentages and go to his bullpen for Jordan Butler. We might be looking at a long save opportunity for Michael Byrne if Vandy can close the gap a little bit. One out in the fifth. Doors with the bases loaded. Tyler Dyson had a pretty good day taken out into the fifth inning, but early the fastball was good. It was electric. It was up, up to 96. Command was really there as he punched out six on the day. Gives up two earned runs. That was on a two-run home run, and he showed you why he's going to be one of the top picks in the country. You can see he's a little bit upset, not wanting to come out of that ball game. You see he's still arguing his case right now. But you want to, as a starting pitcher, look, you want to pick up that W. You want to be around and complete five innings. You can get that W. Everybody says, well, you're out there just to keep, kind of keep the club in the game, and if you do that, that's what you're supposed to do. But don't be fooled by that. Every starting pitcher wants to pick up that win, and when your team goes up and puts up a seven spot for you, you want to be around for five, and you can see he is clearly a little bit upset. Will not get the win and have to complete five innings, obviously, to get that win as a starting pitcher. So here's Butler, who has struck out 28 and 26 in a third. Florida has turned 21 double plays on the season, one of the best fielding teams in the country. Lefty lefty with Butler versus Paul and then Clark on deck. Base is loaded. The first pitch. Big swing and a miss. And it's obvious why Jordan Butler would have success against lefties with that pitch. Yeah. Well, the arm slot, you see the arm slot way down. So when you lefty on lefty matchup, facing Ethan Paul, ball almost starts behind Ethan Paul, then he sweeps it back across the plate. Awfully tough for a left-handed hitter to stay in there. Now down nothing in two. Yeah, so first pitch, you get a breaking ball, starts behind you, it sweeps across for strike one. And he throws you a 90-mile-an-hour fastball just on the outside corner, down 0-2. So plenty of options now for Butler. You like that pitch? Yep. I still like the breaking ball better. I'd like to see him start it in the middle of the plate. Because he's already shown Paul I can throw my breaking ball for a strike. Strike one was with the breaking ball. So now that you put that thought in the hitter's mind. So now you start to throw the same breaking ball, but instead of starting it right at him, you start it in the middle of the plate. You have it sweep right off the outside corner. Misses away again, two and two.
Ethan Paul hit the two-run homers last time up. You could tell he's locked in. I mean, lefty on lefty matchup. He's hanging right in there. Missed with a 90 mile an hour fastball. Nowhere to put him. Time asked for by the freshman catcher, Cal Greenfield. Remember, he started Ethan Paul with a breaking ball, first pitch. It would not surprise me. Even 3 2 count, bases loaded. He doesn't try to finish any with a breaking ball as well. Out of play to the left side. If, if you go to a breaking ball on 3-2, in this situation, are you throwing it for a strike? You're throwing yes. to get him to chase. No, I'm throwing it for a strike. You got to make him earn his way on. Got to be for a strike. But you're still wanting to make a quality pitch. I'm not talking about the hanger. You know, yeah. you hang one up, bell tie right over the middle of the plate, just spinning, not doing anything. It's going to get turned around pretty quickly. Another fastball, and that's strike three called. Took a little something off of the last two. Back to back strikeouts for Vandy with the bases loaded. We talk about strikes and quality strikes. Well, how about that? 3 2 fastball right off the outside corner. I mean, maybe a ball off the outside corner. And Ethan Paul caught looking in a big situation. First pitch strike to Philip Clark. Clark in the three hole for Bandy. Struck out in the first, popped up to left in the third. That's why Butler was brought in to face the lefties. First Paul and now Clark. And you saw Butler on that pitch. He even dropped down more side arms. So he's showing you a couple of different arm slots, which makes it even tougher on lefties. Jones at third, Kaiser at second, Ray at first for Vandy. Bases loaded, two down. Jordan Butler's one-two pitch. Little dribbler to the right side. Tough play for the lefty. Butler scoops, got him. And the doors leave the bases loaded in the fifth inning. No runs on two hits, three stranded. It's a 7 2 lead for the Gators. How about Jordan Butler? Pitchers, you got to be able to field your position quickly. Turns around. Watch this. Quick flip over to first base, and the Gators avoid what could have been a crooked number for the Commodores. Ben McDonald, it's a 7-2 lead for Florida. Clutch pitching and Kevin O'Sullivan's decision to go to the bullpen. Lefty versus lefty pays off in the fifth inning. Here's what it's looked like so far. Four in the first for Florida. And then Jonathan India, two-run home run in the fourth. Florida's offense looks almost unstoppable once again. Vanderbilt going back to the bullpen. Jackson Gillis through an inning and a third in relief of Mason Hickman. Now it's Reed Schaller's turn. Go, 
See Charlotte, another part of that number one recruiting class, just a freshman. Making his eighth appearance, ERA five. Again, look at the strikeouts to Walks. Another big arm for Vanderbilt. 11 hits in nine innings, but 12 strikeouts. Pardon me, Schaller in making his eighth appearance in the season. Are you keeping track of everything I've screwed up today? No. I'm feeling good about the day. My day in Gainesville didn't start very good yesterday at the coffee <laughs> shop, and so I'm feeling pretty good about what happened today. <laughs> had some nice young lady tell me that I was number one in her book. As I went down the wrong way street at the coffee shop the wrong way. So today's a better day. It's Easter. <laughs> Keenan Bell is 0 for 2. You want to tell everybody why he ended up going down the wrong way on a one-way street? Well, I wasn't, but now that you mention it, it's kind of embarrassing. You know, these new cars, I drive a pickup truck, right? And these new cars, it... I couldn't figure out how to get it in reverse. Like you got to, <laughs> I mean, you got to sit on the right side of the seat and hold the steering wheel strongest with the left and push three buttons just to put it in reverse. You know, everything's complicated. And so I couldn't get it in reverse. So I just went forward. <laughs> That's the so, story of your life. The wrong way. Down a one way street. When I got to the end of it, there was a young lady that wasn't too happy about me going down the wrong way. This one's going a long way. DeMarco watches it off of the scoreboard. Keenan Bell, the second home run in as many days. Well, we mentioned Keenan Bell earlier. I mean, what a weapon he is to have at the bottom part of that lineup. The batting average is not great this year, but the home run production is solid. Watch him take this one for a ride. Fastball. Right where most left-handers like it, inner third and down low, and he drops a barrel on it and off the scoreboard. It goes. It is now eight to two. Folks, this is the number eight ranked team in the country in Vanderbilt. They are they are they are no slouches, easy for me to say. And Florida has just banged their way around the ballpark this entire weekend. I'm starting to think, and Aaron Fitt from D1 Baseball is in town covering this series. We talked this over with him last night. I'm starting to think that this year in college baseball, that the elite have really separated themselves. And I'm not sure Oregon State, the way that they've pitched recently, and they lost two out of three to Utah this weekend, would be among the elite. I mean, we're talking, you know, Texas Tech is a really good program. Are they elite? Well, they lost two out of three to Kentucky mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. I mean, Stanford looks elite. Florida looks elite. Arkansas is right there in the discussion. Ole Miss is certainly in that discussion. But I think that it's starting to look like the difference between the haves and the don't quite have it. Right. From number one three to number 10 looks like a real big gap in college baseball this year. Yeah, we talk about Arkansas. We talk about them elite, but people would tell you, well, guess what? They've lost two of their three weekend series in the SEC. How can they be elite when you lose two of your three weekend series? But that's what Arkansas's done. They've lost Ole Miss. Of course, they lose to Florida. Now, the, they're playing two of the top teams, not only in the SEC, but in the country as well. Yeah, so after this weekend, I would say Florida, Stanford, Ole Miss. Mm would be three elite teams. Mm. It, nothing against those other teams. They're great. But, you know, Florida State has had a couple bumps in the road. They needed a walk-off against Louisville to win game one of that series. They lost midweek to Florida. Arkansas, you know, pitching and fielding. Texas Tech. NC State's pretty good. I know you're familiar with what they've done, but that's a five-loss team. Their big sweep at Clemson a couple weeks ago kind of put them on the map. Yeah, they've won every of their one of their ACC series on the year, 23 and five. Of course, nine and three in the ACC. And yeah, I mean, you know, they got Kenneman who's got 12 home runs. Of course, Edwards has eight. And they got a real dude on Friday nights. Brian Brown's got a .41 ERA. So yeah, I mean, they're a really good team as well. But you know, I mean, the way Florida is playing right now, all the way around, it's hard to say they're not the best team. But you know, when you look at that list, and really when you look at top 20, I think, again, it just goes down down the stretch. Getting in the postseason play and getting on a roll and playing good. Because I think all those teams you showed in the top 10 are quite capable of winning a national title if they're firing on all cylinders when it matters the most. 
And health is obviously a key component there. There's a lot of things, yeah. We saw Texas A&M last year. Nobody thought they'd end up in Omaha, but mm -hmm. they got hot at the right time. By the way, TCU's been in Omaha the last few years. Tough loss mm -hmm. for the Horned Frogs last night. Had Oklahoma a big lead. State. Yeah, big lead. Blew that one. Walked them off on a uh, what I thought was a play at the plate that should have gone TCU's way, but they don't have instant replay. Right. In the Big Twelve. Right. Bang bang play at the plate, no replay. Mm -hmm. So that was on ESPNU late last night. Could have been overturned. We might have been the only baseball nerds in the bar watching baseball over basketball. <laughs> That's right. Well, the basketball game wasn't. We tried to watch it, but it just, uh, boy, I tell you what, from the beginning, Kansas got down and just couldn't, couldn't ever really recover. Supernova, 18 of 40 from deep. Yeah, that'll, that'll pretty much do you in. Deacon Lippitt is one for three. Got a runner on. Nice play on the coach's box. Two balls and two strikes to Lippitt. Lip it punched out. One down. I'll be in Charlotte for Battle of the Carolinas. North Carolina and South Carolina should be a packed house, especially if the weather's good. Uptown in the Queen City, Tuesday at 7 o'clock on the SEC Network. Also streaming live on the ESPN app. That's a bb and ballpark. That's a gorgeous ballpark. We were there a couple years ago doing that game, Ben. Yep, North Carolina, South Carolina. Yep. What you think of that ballpark? Beautiful. That's a triple-A ballpark, isn't it? Yep. Be there with David DeLucci Tuesday night. Your buddy. And by the way, yeah, Charlotte for a long time was the Orioles' triple-A home. Mm -hmm. That's right. Cal Ripken came up through the minors there. Two balls and no strikes to Nelson Maldonado. A lot of people don't realize this, but the Iron Man Hall of Famer Cal Ripken is also pretty good at calling pitches. He called every pitch you threw from shortstop for what a three-year period. Yeah, yeah. The better part of my first uh, first first full year in the big leagues. Yeah, I mean, you know, a guy that you could trust. Chris Hoyles was a young catcher, and, of course, I was a young pitcher. You get called up at 21, you have no clue of what you're doing. And Cal came in after one of the nights that I struggled. Me and Chris were sitting there talking. He said, you guys don't have a clue, do you? Said, no, no we, we really don't have a clue. And he said, well, I can tell, and, and I'll be glad to help you, but it's got to stay between us three. It goes no further than this. Nobody else can know about it. Chance so. for two. Here's Paul on the turn and a 6-4-3 double play, and that will end Ben McDonald's story time yes. for the time being. Second twin-killing turn by Vandy today. Showdown is all Florida. Once again, two runs, four hits for Vandy, eight runs on ten hits for Florida, and more home runs for the Gators. They have hit two today. They hit 53 home runs all of last season when they won the national championship. They've already hit 46 home runs this year. And by the way, you know, home runs can fly out of this ballpark from the gap to the poles when the wind is blowing. There, there's no wind today at all. And these are balls that have been just... Crush. I said two today. They've hit three today. Three. Yeah, an opposite way with two of them. Dalton, India, both opposite field shots. Keenan Bell pulled his to right. Yeah, none of them have been wall scrapers. I mean, they've been well over. 
It's a Florida team that only hit 222 in Omaha to win the College World Series. They did it with pitching. They did it with defense. And some timely hitting. I mean, that's that's the whole thing. Yeah, the, uh, defensively, they were outstanding. Didn't make a, an error. Last five games in Omaha. Julian Infante at the plate. Julian hit 11 home runs last year, took part in the TD Ameritrade Home Run Derby at the ballpark in Omaha. Had a blast. blast. He brought up his high school coach to throw BP to him during that Home Run Derby. Griffin Conine of Duke. He's already homer today. He was in that thing. He had his dad, Jeff Conine, throw BP. And Infante able to reach, trying to get it going for Vandy. Vandy's trying to avoid being swept in SEC play. It hadn't happened since 2012. This is their first three-game losing streak since that stretch. 59 consecutive SEC series without a sweep. And by the way, that was also the last time they lost four in a row. They ended up on a five-game losing streak back in 2012. Chance to advance the runner. And Steven Scott with a sacrifice moves Julian Infante up 90 feet. You One. like that call? <sighs> well, Down six in the sixth. Scott's got three home runs. I think you get to a point if you're Tim Corbin where it's, it's not just about this game. It's about stringing together some hits and trying to find some offense somewhere. A little momentum maybe, some confidence builders no matter what. Step by step. Yeah, because I mean if you're Vandy, you, you're starting to, once this series is over, win or lose here, swept or not swept, I mean you got Georgia next weekend, so you you, you know you got to pick up the pieces and you know what Georgia's done this year. And they're just, there's not any off weekends in the SEC. There's just not any. I saw Missouri a couple of weekends ago, and I'm telling you what, talk about an improved team. And they weren't bad last year. 14 and 16 in SEC play was Missouri, but this year, you know, I think they're going to win more than that. Got a big win last night on a drop fly ball late in the game at Auburn on a Trey Harris fly ball. I saw Deoka pitch, and I'll tell you what, you talk about a big man. Mm -hmm. Bryce Montes Deoka. Yeah, you were there. Bounce straight back. Michael Plasmeyer threw really well for him yeah. last night against Auburn. Plasmeyer got a win against LSU earlier this season. And they got TJ Sikama, you know, who's going on game one's farm now. So you run him and Plasmeyer, and you finish with Deoka. Look. Kind of funny, you lose a guy like Tanner Houck and your rotation looks better. Yeah. Well, Plasmeyer's a different pitcher. Dayoka's a little more consistent in the strike zone, plus fastball's up to a hundy, you know, by the way. And so and then you roll Sikama out there, too. So they got some guys. Meisner, look, Meisner's a big league, big league looking prospect. Hot shot to third. India flags it down. What can't he do? That might be your player of the year. Yeah. The stock is rising. There's no doubt about that. I mean, this ball is a rocket. Watch this. Short hop right off the glove side. Spins around. Sets the feet. The rocket. Over to first base. Looked easy. That is not an easy play right there. Kevin O'Sullivan telling us he's a guy that they can put it short if need be. Mm -hmm. He had no problem doing that. Most of the guys that are going to play infield in a program like this outside of first base are, are former shortstops in high school. Sure. Athletes. I mean, that's what you've seen a lot of your top programs go after in high school. Athletes, former shortstops, plug them in anywhere you need them. 
That's what Alonzo Jones was at Columbus High School. Now at the plate with the count one and one. Brings you and gives you great versatility. Christian Hicks last year for Florida got the awesome versatility. He filled in everywhere along the infield with guys being hurt. Into right, Maldonado. Well, both right fielders have been fooled the last inning or two. This dude's on his own continent, Jonathan. And a whole lot more. What a weekend for Jonathan India. This was a Friday night blast into the bleachers and left. India at it again. Opposite field shot, one hop the tree. 11 home runs for Jonathan India, and his best has come against the best. Five of those 11 have come in SEC play. And not a big guy either, but boy, the ball comes off the bat. Look at what he's doing during his 15-game hitting streak. Part of a national championship team last year. And he has upped his game, one and two. By the way, Florida's College World Series win, part of a very impressive calendar year for the Southeastern Conference. Big Schaefer's Mississippi State Bulldogs play for a national title tonight, 6 o'clock on ESPN against Notre Dame for a women's basketball championship. South Carolina, the defending national champs. In the last 12 months, the SEC has claimed eight team NCAA titles. South Carolina in basketball, Alabama in football, Florida in baseball. Kentucky won rifle, Florida won women's tennis, Georgia won women's indoor track, and Florida won both men's indoor and outdoor track. Eight team titles in the last 12 months for the Southeastern Conference. And you know how, just to keep my streak going of messing things up, I did it again. Texas A&M won equestrian. Equestrian. So that would make nine in the last 12 months. According to Kevin Clark, payoff pitch. There's ball four to India. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in this academic year. Ah. Wow. For this academic year, nine in the last 12 months. I apologize to the Texas A&M equestrian team. But Georgia won the SEC equestrian title yesterday. Well, Dalton looks at a strike. You ever been on a horse, Ben? I have. How big was that horse? Hey, pretty big. My feet wasn't dragging the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Dalton, two for two, two run double and a solo home run. 15 home runs junior college last year for Will Dalton. Only a handful of home runs his last two years of high school. He's put on 100 pounds since he was a senior in high school. 100 pounds? Wait, hold on a second. Hold on. I was, I'm probably wrong. There's no way he weighs no, 105 now. <laughs> no, since he was a sophomore in high school, he's put on 100 pounds. Pitch was up. Throw down to second is wide. 25 pounds a year. It's a lot of trips to Embers. <laughs> yes, it is. Jonathan India just took off early from first base and Schaller never saw him break early. Two balls and a strike to Dalton. Pretty good slider right there. Starts that pitch right on the outside corner. Looks like a fastball, and Dalton goes to get it. Of course, it's a foot and a half off the outside corner. 
Yeah, so Dalton found his power stroke working with one of his junior college coaches. He said, I'd always been able to hit for average. And I feel like I can do both now. The idea was to get something to drive and get it in the air. Not that he wants to hit pop-ups, but Ben, what he was talking about last week was, you know, line drives have a chance to carry. Something on the ground does you no good. Got the strength to do it. Why not? He's hit 11 home runs this season. First year in the SEC. Mm -hmm. He's done well. I mean, he's had an outstanding year coming from junior college. And there's, there's some truth to that. Ground balls do get through the hole occasionally, though. Schaller misses low to J.J. Schwartz. 214 career RBI tied with Brad Wilkerson, who was here in the late 90s. Second most in Gator history. Preston Tucker with the Atlanta Braves right now. Drove in 258 from 09 to 12. Two and oh. Yeah, JJ's had a fine season. You know, sometimes it's tough because he had such a tremendous freshman year that I think the bar was set really high in a lot of people's eyes, so we go back and judge him against that. But I, I, I wanted to bring that up from this perspective. Florida's offense is smoking hot right now, and J.J. Schwartz has been okay. I mean, oh. he's sitting in the five spot, and if this guy gets going, yeah. it takes it to another level. Wild pitch will move India to third. The home run numbers are pretty good, but you're right, 284. Average not that great, but solid. And their numbers are down in conference play, which certainly most people will go backwards once you get into this league out of the non-conference. Yeah, typically all SEC teams, batting average goes down. ERA has a tendency to go up once conference play it begins. Fourth in the country in home runs as a freshman. Yeah, and look, he put a lot of pressure, and people expected him to come back and do it again, or maybe even do better. And of course, that just wasn't going to happen. He is a very even keeled player from a temperament perspective. You know, and his, you know, his freshman year, he set, what, back in the seven hole, the eight hole for yep. Florida, and just sat back there and pounded some balls. Nobody really knew who he was and put up the numbers pretty quickly. You mentioned it yesterday, four homers in one game. But then all of a sudden you move. I don't care what anybody says. You know, you always, as a pitcher and a pitching coach and a guy sitting in a bucket calling the pitches, you're going to pitch the, the three, four, five guys a lot differently than you're going to pitch the seven, eight, nine guys. It's just what you do. Because typically that's going to be your best guys, the best hitters that you're going to face. You're going to bear down the most as a pitcher on that three, four, and five guy. Different. Well, they learned who he was in the postseason. He had a great postseason as a freshman. Hit 491 with five home runs. He was the MVP of the SEC tournament. The most outstanding player in the Gainesville Regional. Oh, it was a phenomenal freshman year. But, you know, we were talking about going from a Saturday or Sunday guy in the weekend rotation to being the Friday night guy. Well, it's the equivalent from batting, you know, towards the bottom of your lineup, and all of a sudden you jump into three hole. Yeah. Because it's just different. I mean, you're sitting in the middle of the lineup. You're the guy that's supposed to hit the home runs, is supposed to drive in the runs. You're supposed to be the best hitter on your club. And it's a different mindset when you go from Sunday to Friday night as, a, as an ace or back of the lineup to sitting right in the middle of that lineup. Upstairs, there's ball four. Second walk from Schaller. Tonight at 6 Eastern right here on the SEC Network. It's a top ten showdown on the diamond. This one has a circle, not a mound. Georgia and Tennessee from Knoxville. Also streaming live on the ESPN app. This game two of their series, Tennessee with a walk-off hit by pitch. A 1-0 win yesterday. Georgia shut out for the first time this season. Runners in the corners, infield back now for Austin Langworthy, who was one for two with a double. Run scored and one driven in, and Schaller drops in a breaking ball. So 
Chandler Taylor hit a two run home run for Alabama in the first inning. Crimson tied with a two nothing lead finale of that series. They're at home against Kentucky trying to take the series. After us on the SEC Network, Missouri and Auburn. So that would be Daoka today for Missouri, right? Right. All six foot seven, 270 pounds of him. That's it? That's it. Just a young guy. And it's not a CC Sabathia type body. Oh, right? no. No, a, no, no, no. No, he's. Remember that day I asked him if he went to the weight room after he pitched the next day? I said, you'd like you're big enough to pick up the, the whole weight room. He just said, yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, it's it, it's not a soft body at all. It's it's 270 pounds of firmness. Only three games in the league today. Everybody else wrapped up early. Light schedule in college baseball today. On this Easter weekend. Only a handful of top 25 games, including Duke at home against Notre Dame. They're tied in the eighth inning. Illinois, in some polls, has a 2 0 lead against Iowa in the fifth inning in Champaign. And Rice leads a ranked Southern Miss team in the first inning. Wayne Graham's season not going as planned for the legendary Rice head coach. They are really struggling. Yeah, they struggled last year this time, remember? Then and caught fire at the end and was able to keep the streak going. Consecutive postseason appearances, NCAA tournament. Blake Reese is two for three today. Michigan's playing Delaware this weekend. They're tied at one. Michigan has won 11 in a row. So Alabama's going for the sweep of Kentucky. Nick Bingione in Kentucky had a sensational season last year. They nearly won the SEC. They're in it to the end. Yeah, Made it to a super regional against Louisville. And who would have thought Kentucky, as good as they were, you know, weeks ago, would start two of their first three series, not only losing them, but getting swept in two of three. They got swept by Arkansas to begin SEC play. Did Kentucky. They went two out of three against Auburn last weekend, and now in jeopardy of getting swept again, this time by Alabama. 2-2 two, two pitch is lifted foul. By the way, we're talking about the tournament committee seeding 1 through 16 this year. That will cost us some geographical matchups, and last year Louisville was the number 7 national seed. I don't think they would have necessarily matched up with Kentucky in the Supers had you seeded 1 through 16. Mm -hmm. And that was a remarkable atmosphere and two great rivals going head to head for Louisville to make it back to Omaha. Kentucky has never been. So that will cost us from a fan experience, cost us some matchups like that. Sometimes it'll work out. But it should level the playing field. So does that mean it's going to be set strictly on RPI? So whatever the top. Not strictly on RPI, more on seedings. You know, like I know, the but RPI is certainly the seeding is going to go. With the, no, with they the won't RPI. be in lockstep. It'll be so there could decision. be some number fudging then to make sure that Louisville Kentucky matchup does. It could be, yeah. You know, if, if in other words, they're just one or two off, you know, a little I, bit of wiggle I room. See, yeah, I could see a scenario where you'd still match them up. Now, if, if they're five or six spots off, you can't do that. But you know, if it's in the ballpark, and a lot of folks who lose in the middle of the Final Four and the, the national championship on the men's basketball side, they're not seated one through 68. I mean, yes, right. one through 16 per region, but there is seed movement and mm -hmm. seeding movement I'd line sometimes too, depending on meeting certain parameters. Yeah, because I still love the idea of some of those teams matching up, you know, in a super somewhere, if the numbers are, are very, very close. 
Ball four, third walk. This inning and Reese aboard for Keenan Bell, who's already homered. Be at AM this week, Thursday night for the LSU game a couple years ago. Texas AM and TCU from a seeding standpoint certainly should not have matched up in a super regional. Right. Two of the best teams in the country. AM was really the, the number nine seed, if you want to think about it like that. And only one of them were, was able to make it to Omaha. Tim Corbin having to go back to the bullpen. Eight of the last 13 Florida hitters have worked the count full against Vandy pitchers. So the pitch count through the roof and Schaller's done after 50. Back to the pen and back to Gainesville in a moment. DC Network. Keenan Bell rocketing multiple home runs this weekend. That was part of a seven run seven. In Florida's blowout win yesterday. And then back at it today. Solo shot in the fifth. Reed, Reed Shallow. Bell waiting to bat against his third different Vanderbilt pitcher. 0 for 1 against Mason Hickman. Struck out against Jackson Gillis and homered against Shaller. He'll face Hugh Fisher now, freshman from Eads, Tennessee. Sixth appearance for Fisher. Yeah, and the freshmen just keep on a coming for Vanderbilt. Big, tall, slim left hander, fastballs in upper 80s, show you a 90 occasionally, breaking ball, change up as well. Eads, Tennessee, just outside of Memphis. Vanderbilt, from a roster perspective, really covers the entire country. You got guys on this team from. Pacific Northwest from Florida from as always Tim Corbin's backyard in the Northeast and then throughout the tri-state uh, uh, pardon me the volunteer state in all sides of it West Tennessee the mid state and of course East Tennessee yesterday's starter Patrick Rabies from Knoxville and here's Hugh Fisher out of Memphis 15 different states and Canada represented on this Vanderbilt roster. One of five teams in the nation to have a starting lineup at any point this year that was made up of players from nine different states. Fisher's breaking balls off the thumbs and into the stands. Fisher through the first game of the series, two thirds scoreless. Hasn't allowed an earned run this season. He's from Briarcrest Christian in the Memphis area. Hadn't thrown in an SEC game in his career until this weekend. Chopped to third. Ray will kick the bag, and that'll close the home sixth. It's eight to two Gators. Dyke on the ground. He'll come home with it. Rivera tags Robertson. Boom! Lippitt with the bases loaded. Deacon Lippitt makes it 5-1 Florida. On the ground to second. And the Gators get their first College World Series championship. A 6-1 final in game number two. And the Gators look to become the fourth since 1996 to repeat as national champs. Ray Tanner's team did it, 2010 and 11. Pat Casey's Oregon State squad in 06 and 07. And LSU under Skip Burtman in 96 and 97. What do you remember about those LSU teams? Powerful. You know, the Gorilla Ball era, homers. Flying out of the ballpark. I got the Brad Cressy era, some solid starting pitching and relievers. How about this idea? And we discussed it a while ago. Walk off winners for LSU and College World Series. Warren Morris, of course, had the famous home run. Right. As Jack Leftwich enters for Florida, freshman from Orlando. 
And he had how many home runs during the regular season? Before None. Zero. Yeah. Then he gets a hold of one, yanks it to right. Brad Cressy was a muscle bound power hitter, and his walk off winner was a little worm burner that went right up the middle. Yeah, kind of got jammed and just kind of shot it in the hole over there. A little humpback liner. Point being, if you predict which of those two would have wa hit a walk-off winner as a home run, right. you would have flipped them. Well, Warren Morris's was incredible because, you know, he was a kid that you know broke his hand or his wrist and, and set out most of the year and, 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 and started coming back right at the end of the season. And even when he did come back, you know, he pretty much bunted his first week or two because he couldn't really swing the bat. So he just bunted, and then finally the, the arm started to get a little bit more healthier and, and, and he was able to swing away. A roller to Blake Reese. And Connor Kaiser is retired. One down. That'll bring Harrison Ray to the plate. Ray was hit by a pitch his first time up. Breaking ball in for his strike. Harrison Ray's a Florida guy out of Longwood, Lake Brantley High School. In foul territory, long run India won't quite get there. Remember the former Detroit Tiger, Chet Lemon? Oh, yeah. Now runs an AAU team that Harrison played for. They won back to back national championships. Great article in the Tennessean this week about how Vanderbilt parents keep in touch with how the team's doing, especially when the team is, well, either the team's on the road or parents that can't get there. And Harrison's mom, Tracy, was written, she's the big communicator. So she will text other parents, text some pictures, text some updates on how their child is doing and throughout the game. And she said, listen, I know I'm lucky that I can be there. I know other parents want to know how their kid is doing. So she's the communicator then, huh? Uh-huh. Taking pictures and texting. And I wonder what those emojis look like on that text chain this weekend. Probably not all good. Two down. Tonight at 8.30, the SEC Now team will be back to break down the women's national championship game between Mississippi State and Notre Dame. Peter Burns has been in Starkville and Dari Noka is in Columbus. We'll also take a look at the baseball and softball matchups. Nobody covers the SEC like we do. Also streaming live on the ESPN app. Did you see Nell on wheels last night on SEC Now? She gave a pep talk to the Mississippi State team. She got real fired up. I think you say she's got just like a, just a tad bit of energy. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's a, it's got to be a lot of caffeine going there. Did you guys get a pep talk? In the College World Series from Skip Burtman? Was he a big pep talk guy? Yeah. I mean, Dale was better. Oh, yeah, Dale's a great communicator, right? Yeah. Dale could make you think you could run through a brick wall, but right before a basketball game. Infield playing him to pull it and pop it up. Who wants it? Long run for Bell. And he was called off by Jonathan India, so Bell laid off the throttle. Nobody can get to it. I think India thought that he was going to have to make the play. Greenfield never saw it, the catcher. Yeah, but to me, it's Bell's ball all the way, though. I mean, the, the ball is right up the first baseline. It, it's, it's 50 feet from where Bell's feet were planted when the bat was swung. You know, and India, you know, you can tell he's aggravated. He's had to run all the way across, and the ball lands on the foul side of the first baseline. We saw Vanderbilt last night have a, you know, yesterday had a problem with that. Yeah. It's just communication. It is communication in the infield. I got it. You take it. I got it. You take That's it. That's it. To short. Lip it. Fires. One, two, three frame. Eight to Florida. Time to stretch in Gainesville as the Gators look for a series sweep.
Florida's mashing the ball this season. Defending national champs are nearing their number home runs hit last year. We're just at the midway point. They got it started with Will Dalton in the third inning. Then Jonathan India with a two run shot in the fourth. In the fifth, it was Keenan Bell with his second this series. Those some hot bats. Seventh inning. Friday they scored five. Seventh inning. Yesterday they scored seven. They enter the bottom of the seventh now. They don't need another seven. They have a six run lead. Yeah, they got it on cruise control right now, but this is where, you know, Vanderbilt pitching was pretty good up to the seventh in both of those games, and then all of a sudden, kind of hit a brick wall. And I think, you know, same thing what we saw early today. Florida's just not missing pitches right now. And you make mistakes, leave a ball up, out, over the plate, it's getting barreled up. If you're lucky, and maybe they hit it to somebody if you're lucky. This is a good sign. It's almost, yeah, is that a cramp maybe? He seemed trying to pull that toe back like it's, and stretch it a little bit like the high hamstring is cramping up a little bit. Well, Cal Greenfield <laughs> got to start behind the plate today on a warm day. J.J. Schwartz DHing after got his knee banged up yesterday. John Michelini, the trainer for Florida. Yeah, clearly when Greenfield swung him. That's what it is. He's yeah, he's uh, he's cramping up just a little bit's what that was. Quick shot of liquid. And boy, if you've never had one of those. A little Charlie Horse in the hind quarter. I'm told I'm told bananas help in that regard. It does. A little potassium. Might be a little late for that. Might be more time for an IV at this point. <laughs> Well, one reason I haven't cramped yet today is because of the bananas foster dessert we had last night. Does that count? Yeah, it's potassium. He's got potassium. Yeah, I'm just worried about the whipped cream and ice cream they had on top <laughs> of it. I don't know how good that is. I'm not worried about it at all. Brady Smith can also catch. He's catching in the bullpen right now. They're giving him time to stretch it out, aren't they? Yeah, I think he's trying to see. He's looking like he's almost scared to move, like it's going to tighten right back up again. Of course, when you're catching on a warm day like today, you lose a lot of fluids. It doesn't look like it's going to loosen up at all because he's not moving on it very much. He's trying it, but he's like, I'm, I think I'm done. It's not going to loosen up. So pinch hitter will inherit a 2-2 count. In this situation, take another look at the swing from Greenfield. Yeah, watch the right leg right there. See him grab it. Boy, he straightens it out in a hurry, which is normally a sign of a cramp. So Brady Smith hustles his way down. You know, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier. You need to develop some depth at that position relative to where Florida was last year with three very capable catchers. Mm -hmm. So Greenfield will take the rest of the day off. And Brady Smith a chance to hit. In this scenario, the pinch hitter cannot be hurt by the outcome of the at-bat. You inherit a 2-2 count, but any negative like a strikeout would go to uh, <laughs> would be charged to Greenfield. You got a doppelganger here for uh, Brady Smith. See anybody he reminds you of? Let me look here. I see a little Jason Bourne in there. Matt Damon. Yeah. How about them apples? Oh, Kaiser with a nice play. That's where Connor Kaiser hangs out, though. So you come in off the bench, and I mean barrel it up. Sitting at the end of the bench in the shade a little bit, just kind of minding your own business. Come in, you find a barrel. 
But how about six foot four Connor Kaiser? A lot of people think he may be the best defensive shortstop in the SEC. Makes an outstanding play. Kaiser Sose. Yeah, what movie was that? Let me see how good you are. Well, I remember the Maxwell House at the end. Uh, that was one of my favorite movies. Here's Deacon Lippin. What movie was that? I can't remember. <laughs> Wait a minute now. Uh, Kaiser Sose. He made, him, made a, he made up the story at the end of the detective. Remember, he's reading off the bulletin board behind him. Makes up the entire story. Usual All the suspects. Names. Yes. Usual suspects. Good movie. Lippitt is one for four. Talked a lot about Connor Kaiser's talent defensively. Rangy shortstop always seems to be in the right place. He was a point guard growing up. He played on the same AAU team in the Kansas City area as Missouri quarterback Drew Locke. He was a point guard. Locke will be a three-year starter for Barry Odom at quarterback. Uh, Locke was a shooting guard, and Kevin Perrier plays basketball for Consul Martin in Mizzou, was also on that team. You got one AU basketball team, and guys playing three different SEC sports. I love the kids that play multiple sports, you know, especially growing up. Connor Kaiser, you can see, I mean, basketball helps his footwork so much the position he plays at shortstop, but that's six foot four. I mean, that's a big body. Rangy that's going to fill out. That's kind of where pro ball's going now. The guys are so big. Here's Nelson Maldonado. I mean, well, you played. Guy behind you with Baltimore was a pretty big dude at short. Hall of Famer. Yeah, Junior was 6'5 and played the position. Not many people know how big Junior really was, but he played the position at 6'5 and weighed 225 to 30 pounds during the season. And that was many years ago. And A-Rod comes along and others that are, you know, good-sized guys. Two balls and a strike. Fisher facing Maldonado, who is one for three. Six five. I didn't know Cal Ripken yep. was that tall. Certainly playing height he was. I mean, I think it's official six four and three quarters listed, but that's barefoot. Big guy. You don't play baseball barefoot though. Nope. You better not. Fisher with his first walk. I mean, that's no fun. You you walk the two hole hitter. Now you got to face Jonathan India. It was one for two with a two run home run today. Four thirty eight batting average. Yeah, this this late in the year. Midway point. Nice pitch. You know, it's just so quiet this year. You know, if you watch him when he comes set, I mean, the bat's just resting on his shoulder. Watch him. He'll rest it on his shoulder, and as the pitcher starts to wind up, he'll take it off and just put it in a nice, relaxed position. Just kind of sets it right there. Everything's relaxed. Not a whole lot of moving parts. Up, simple to load position. So that's a big thing for hitters. If you watch hitters from the side, you, you don't want to see a guy where the head's moving. If the head is moving as you start your stride and you go to swing at a ball, you know, it's really tough to hit a ball coming at you and your head's going forward, too. You want that head to be awfully still. And if you watch India hit this year, there's not a whole lot of movement in that head at all. It's nice and still. And see, that's the difference right there. I mean, you know, if you watched him last year, year before last, swung at a lot of marginal pitches. This year, I don't, you know, so much more mature to play. I mean, it's a more mature approach, a more a patient approach. And, it, and I guess it boils down to understanding the strike zone, recognizing the strike zone better than ever. Because every time you turn around, it seems like he's hitting in a plus count. You know, it's 3-1, it's 2-0, it's 1-0. 
course, those are the ideal counts to hit in. Runner goes, pitches a strike, throw to second is in time. Beautiful throw from Ty Duval, who's behind the plate now for Vandy. And Maldonado caught stealing to end the inning. We go to the eighth, clock ticking on Vandy, trying to find some offense late, down a half dozen. Mama Osprey brought in for lunch today. Probably a fish. How about that? Best seat in the house, right? Nest above the light standards here at McKeithen Stadium. A couple of moves. Nick Horbath is in the game in center field. That'll push Will Dalton to right. And Nelson Maldonado's day is done. Brady Smith stays in the game behind the plate. See him check the wristband. This is uh, in two programs that have decided against using the wireless technology available to send yeah. in pitch calls. Part of a pace of play initiative, experimental rule in the SEC. As much time as we spend waiting on pitching coaches to send in calls. Here's India showing great range. And he makes it look easy, doesn't it? Ethan Paul retired, one down. Yeah, it's almost, I mean, it's been looking like now it's starting to feel like a big leaguer. You know, I mean, just the, you know, the way he approached that fly ball, wasn't wide up, off, you know, trying to get to the fence really quick. He knew he had plenty of time, got under it, waited for it to come back a little bit, didn't overrun the baseball like we've seen happen several times in this series. You tuned in waiting for Missouri and number 11 Auburn. We will get you there as soon as we're finished here. In the meantime, you can find that on the alternate channel. As always, go to the app. It will always live there. Philip Clark with a line drive single. Be the rubber game of that series between the Tigers. What a year for Auburn, by the way, trying to make it Back to glory. They haven't been to Omaha since Tim Hudson was on the mound and in center field for him in the late 90s. That's right. Auburn's a team that wasn't even ranked preseason. Certainly has made some noise so far. They came in ranked 11th this past week in the USA Today coaches poll for Auburn. Won their first SEC weekend. Against Texas A&M, lost two of three last weekend at Auburn against Kentucky. Our buddy Gabe Gross now on Butch Thompson's staff over there. Working with the hitters. You know, the turnaround there is remarkable for a lot of reasons, as Smith will go have a word with Jack Leftwich quickly. Uh, not the least of which is you hear coaches – in this day and age, talk about taking over a program, and the first complaint they have, and it is common, is that recruiting so starts so early in baseball now that you're two cycles behind when you take a new job. That's true. Yeah. And I really wish that's something they would change. I mean, because for me, a 14-year-old kid, you know, you're 14. You don't know where you want to go to school yet. You might think you know, but so many things happen in the next five or six years before you even get to that school. The coach could change. There's a lot of things that could happen. I'd like to see him get back to just saying, hey, you know, nobody can commit until at least your junior year. Talking with Connor Kaiser before the game today, he committed to Vanderbilt as a sophomore. Baker will head down to the Florida pen. I would like to ask Gabe Gross now that he's seen Casey Mize up close for a while now. 
What would what would your hitting approach be off of Casey Mize? The Friday night guy, the ace for Auburn. Boy, what a year Mize is having. Mize already 70 punch outs. How many walks? Three. He's That's walked, insane. Walk three guys. And that's in how many innings pitched? Let's see. You said he had four pitches that he can throw for 47 strikes. innings pitched, three walks, and 70 strikeouts. Is that good? Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I mean, look, he, he's as close to being big league ready you'll see in college baseball right now as far as pitchers go. Infante goes down swinging, two down. Because, I mean, it's four-plus pitches. It's a fastball, you know, 92 to 96 all day long, and he can really spot it. See the record on the year, the ERA. And how about that? That's almost unbelievable. 70 strikeouts to three walks. Okay, so if you're going to ask Gabe Gross what his approach would be against Mize as a hitter, here's right. my question. What is Casey Mize's best pitch? I think that's what separates him. His best pitch could be any of the four that particular day because they're all plus. In other words, he can beat you with all four of his pitches. He's developed more of a cut fastball this year that he's using. He's, of course, got the good breaking ball. The split finger fastball is certainly a swing and miss pitch and probably his best out pitch, but he can beat you with the fastball too. And what really separates him, again, is not so much stuff. It's command of the stuff that he has because there's a big difference in throwing a strike and throwing a quality strike. And Casey Mize throws quality strikes. Hardly ever seen in the middle part of the plate. Tied with all at the plate for Vanderbilt. I'm thinking about talking about golden spikes we were earlier. I mean, look, you got to put him. Jonathan India's up there in the SEC. I think Casey Mize is right there beside him. Mm -hmm. Weekend for India. Check swing. Did he go? He did not. Michael Banks down the third base line denied the appeal. You be the judge of this one. This is awfully close, but I think he held it up. Swing and a miss. Back-to-back -back K's for left, which Vandy strands a runner in the eighth. We go to the home half. Six-run lead for the Gators. Huh. What's the Osprey's name? Oscar the Osprey. Is he in Columbus? Oh All right, gang, thanks. Here, bottom of the eighth inning. Florida leads Vandy eight to two. Might be a historic day for the SEC. Mississippi State looking for its first ever national championship in any sport. Six o'clock tonight on ESPN against Muffet McGraw, Notre Dame. Here's my scouting report for that game tonight. The national championship. Whichever team gets into foul trouble is going to lose that game. Because both teams play six players, essentially. Right. They don't have a very deep bench either not, one. Not deep. Notre Dame's lost four players this year to torn ACLs. Oh, wow. Four and Mississippi State and Vic Schaefer don't go very deep. So right. if you lose one player or one player gets it's in a foul trouble, maker, huh? absolutely. That's my scouting report. Here's Chandler Day making his sixth appearance of the season. 4-8-0 ERA, 15 strikeouts in as many innings pitched. So here's my prediction for the game. Okay. If one team makes 18 three-pointers <laughs> in one game, <laughs> I'm saying they're probably going to win. Yeah, probably so. 
Chandler Day came into Vandy a couple years ago with high expectations. Facing India. Look at this. Two walks, a home run, couple of runs scored. And comfortable in the box. This is a pitcher. How do you make him uncomfortable? Well, I mean, that's the whole thing. You know, and at some point, somebody's got to bite the bullet a little bit and, and run a fastball inside. I mean, you, you're not trying to hit him. But when I see a guy that's awfully comfortable in the box, you know, and he can take a ball that's on the outside part of the plate and he can go out and hook and turn, that means he's not respecting the ball inside. So you don't try to hit a guy, but what you do, do is you throw a fastball, a good one, inside, off the plate a little bit. Make him move his feet a little bit. Make him move his feet. If you can make a hitter move his feet a little bit, that makes him uncomfortable. I think you were uncomfortable when that driver flipped you the bird. I was. And you were it hurt my feelings a little bit. <laughs> You're a very sensitive guy, I am. McDonald. I am. It hurt my feelings. Will Dalton in the cleanup spot, two for three. Including a home run in the third. Did she go double barrel? Is that right? No, because she kept one one hand on the steering oh, wheel, thank gosh, or she might have run into me. Conscientious driver. Yeah. But she had the mouth thing going at the same time. The, you know, the I'm your number one was going, so it, it hurt my feelings. It was verbal and visual. Yes. And it was up close, too, because I'm going down the street the wrong way, so, like, she would tell me I'm right by her, you know. <laughs> Ooh, good breaking ball. Two and two. Yeah, Chandler Day's always had good stuff. You know, he's kind of in and out of the rotation a little bit. But I like the arm action, too, and watch the whip on this breaking ball. Did he go? Yep. yep. Back to back K's for Chandler Day. Gets India and gets Dalton in the heart of this Florida batting order. J.J. Schwartz. 0 for 2 with a hard hit ball in the third inning that was caught at the wall by Austin Martin. Well, oh, JJ Schwartz going to keep driving in runs this year, and the reason is is that he, you know, he's a good hitter. Plus, Jonathan India, who hits in front of him, Will Dalton, who hits in front of him, are always on base. It seems like so he's going to have many opportunities. Foul territory. Ray is there. Kaiser loses his hat on the run and makes the catch. One, two, three, eight for Florida. We go to the ninth. Last chance for the Bandy Boys. Down six. Eight to two, Florida leading Vanderbilt. Commodores under Tim Corbin have been a model franchise, a picture of consistency. It's been six years since they suffered an SEC sweep. It was right here at Florida in 2012. 59 consecutive three game SEC series without being swept in that span, and they're three outs away from being swept here. Here's Pat DeMarco pitches inside. DeMarco's had an interesting path to Nashville. He's a New Yorker out of Staten Island, played a poly prep. High school teammate of Nick Stores, who's playing at LSU. Stores was a fantastic player when these guys were both coming up. DeMarco's like, you know, nobody really knew who I was at the time. But he got a chance to play with Team Elite, AAU team in the Atlanta area. Met a bunch of kids from Georgia. Enjoyed the time there and enjoyed the idea 
that in the South you can play year round, and that wasn't possible in New York City, no matter the borough. So eventually, he and his dad moved to the Atlanta metro area, moved to Winder, Georgia. His dad would be with him through the week, and the approval, obviously, of mom. They looked at it as an investment in his baseball future. His dad is a commodities trader, so he could work from anywhere, pop up to center. Two down. We got the best of both worlds, and uh, discovered by Vandy. And now enjoying the SEC. Two down here. Connor Kaiser spot in the lineup. Don't forget, we'll get you to Mizzou and Auburn as soon as we finish here. In the meantime, you can find it on the alternate channel or on the app. Breaking ball in for a strike. Nothing in two. Florida and out away from a series sweep against the number eight team in the country. Line drive. Horvath on the run. Got it. That'll end the game and that'll end the series. How sweet it is. The Gators do it to Vandy for the second time in six years. Doors had gone 59 straight SEC series without being swept. Florida will be the new number one. Much to